Hello, everyone. I am alive. Um, oh, dear. Uh, one quick second. I think I made a Twitter mistake. <laughs> Cool. And the Cool Eagle, thank you very much for tweeting out the stream, or at least liking the stream. Um, on the odd chance that you are watching, it has been a while since I have directly uh, spoken to you, and I hope you are well, um, because it has been a while since I've caught one of your casts, and I tremendously appreciate the fact that you are still um, interacting. Uh, so... Definitely let yourself be known if you heard this and <laughs> would like to would like to say hi. Um, as for the rest of you, welcome. This is Cultus Simulator. I'm sure a great many of you who are hearing this already know what you are in store for. Um, so I suppose uh, for those of you who watch the YouTube stuff, or at the very least look at the descriptions, uh, you'll notice that for some reason, and this really started with the... Uh, the, the dancer um, lunch. Um, I've always been chatty uh, during Cult of Simulator, and there are lots of reasons for that, and reasons that I've sort of elaborated on on the broadcast, but it definitely feels like I am being even more uh, chatty on, on the dancer, uh, to a point where sometimes the game gets put on hold in, in more of a way than I, I sort of intended. And some people say that this is just me maybe being a little more conscious of how I always play the game, uh, and I've been pleasantly surprised that a lot of the feedback has been that that really doesn't matter. Um, but with that in mind, I definitely feel that I can do a better job of balancing the priorities. I think it's possible to engage with some of the game's ideas um, while playing it and, and getting a little bit more progress. Um, I've sort of learned every time I announce I'm going to do something uh, different or uh, that I'm going to, you know, try to do better, something else comes up uh, and there are perfectly justified. I mean, this is the thing that's nice about a lot of live broadcast is you don't quite know what's going to come at you. And um, on good days, I, I give good responses. And on bad days, I'm not good at giving responses. Uh, and it's a learning experience. Um, but uh, I, I am a little conscious of the time that I have available to me. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to try anything new so much as I'm going to uh, come up with a few different balances. Oh dear, we've got a white name which I can't see. Hey, Scruffy SX. Um, but yeah, um, I uh, I have a few ideas, um, and most importantly, I actually kind of want to see what some of the deeper uh, mysteries of of the dancer content is. I've been spending a lot of time building things up, but uh, we haven't really gotten into a point where I've I've really transformed my character yet, and that'll be coming relatively soon. Good evening to you as well, Captain Shield. I always want to take a quick minute here and give some uh, give some recognition, especially because uh, this list is growing and growing and growing, and more importantly, uh, you won't be able to stay for the stream, unfortunately, but you'll pop in later if you can. Not a problem at all, Captain Shield. I am a little conscious of uh, the hour, and I have a bit of um, I have some work that I need to do. So, um, if I'm not around, uh, do not take it as a as a slight, but um, do take it as uh, me being responsible with my time. So, anyways, uh, responsibilities: design, writing, and coding. Alexis Kennedy. Production, marketing, and biz. Lottie Bevan. UI design and coding by Martin Narukar. Uh, all three people follow... Actually, all of these people are followable on, on Twitter. Um, uh, at F Factory Weather for the Weather Factory Twitter account. 
at Alexis Kennedy for Alexis Kennedy, at Tron Bevan for Lottie Bevan. Uh, I believe it's at uh, M. Nerukar for Martin Nerukar, who does have uh, Nowhere Profit, which you can pick up. Um, we've got Catherine Unger, Clockwork Cuckoo, Lottie Bevan, and Sarah Gordon uh, lending their art talents towards the game. I definitely know Sarah Gordon is active on Twitter. The other ones I'm a little less certain about. Lovely mu- music that you're listening to. Mary Beth Solomon, Brent Barkman, Mickey Irby for Mickey Mar Productions Limited. And I, it's, I'm getting hints that there's some kind of a soundtrack in the works, but I'm not quite sure what's, uh, what's coming out with that, but it looks like that's on the horizon. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised with the audio because it's worth remembering that I had been playing the game for many months before the finished, uh, the finished version. And so to be able to just have all these little clicks and 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 shuffling sounds and all of that, they did a really wonderful job with. Um, I almost liken it a bit to you know how if you play Hearthstone, and I'm not a huge Hearthstone fan, but I do. One thing I do like is how you can sort of click on everything, and it gives you this little you know little puff of interaction and things. Um, I think one of the things that really sold me on the the like original release version of Cult of Simulator was just all of those little touches that audio brings in. And I think it's because I was able to do this sort of on-off test. You know, I experienced it without it, and then I listened to it. And I mean, obviously, because of the way that the cast is set up, I... Uh, I'm a little bit conscious about what audio gives to uh, gives to a um, an experience, but uh, very lovely done uh, audio work done by Soundcuts. The reason why we see the special thanks uh, so much lower is we've got a very special credit here: additional writing by Lottie Bevan. Um, I also think I have a better appreciation for a question that I was asked about uh, what romance ending I got at the end of um, at the end of the stream, uh, the uh, the Steam stream that is. Uh, we've got additional coding by Fraser McCormick and Chris Payne, additional design by Callan Porter, and finally special thanks to Sonia and PK, Matt Hostie, Haley Urias, and literally everyone who has ever sent feedback or bug report. Thank you. Um, and I need to I need to do bug reports, but then I also need to encounter enough things to say that they're bugs. So one last quick uh, hello to SE Knight. Good to see you. Uh, it's actually filled in quite quickly. Uh, this is the thing. So apparently I can get away with starting late if I do call to simulator, but I have uh, taken your time long enough. Let's dive in. Johnny Big Time, thank you very much for the retweet. I hope you are doing well, my friend. Um, where were we? Where were we indeed? Because we were making some progress with our lore. Um, and I believe I was about to disappoint Lord Timothy because he has proposed marriage. I'm definitely making some progress as far as lore, not as much in terms of recruiting cultists. Thank you. No, not at all, Captain Shield. I am very reluctant to... Uh, to look at clips of myself, but I got some very warm receptions to those uh, to those clips. So you know, I I don't take myself so seriously that I'm I'm not allowed to have you know silly moments uh, appear on on Twitter and such. For those of you who don't know what Captain Shield is talking about, uh, he and Joshy Man clipped two things from Crusader Kings on Monday which I had some bad luck in that game, let's say. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, so. Um, but yeah, uh, this is about Cult of Simulators, so we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave it at that. So uh, one of my sources of income will probably be going away in about 72 seconds. He is not at all interested in me dancing for him any further. So we will leave it at that. Um, I can consider getting a commission from Dr. Ibn Aladim. Um, I can not fulfill my commission because I don't have Grail lore. 
I definitely want to be spending some time in my study because, of course, I've I've translated a lot of these. Uh, I've translated a lot of this um, this patron money into uh, into um, books and such, but uh, we haven't necessarily turned it into uh, we haven't necessarily turned it into to anything that advances our cause. This is, in fact, where we're living that right now. So the skin I bear will grow too small, and so I must begin to abandon it. I will need to send a part of myself to learn how. So in this case here, I've not yet learned a lesson, and this means that I will uh, suffer some restlessness because I've not been fulfilling my ambition. Now, if you're interested, basically, in terms of getting into the head of a character like this. And to me, this is one of the most satisfying ways to play Cultus Simulator. You know, whether or not you have experienced this yourself, I think most people can relate to the idea or know someone who has great ambitions. In fact, maybe they even have the ability to realize those ambitions. Um, but there's always uh, another reason to put it off. There's always another, um, there's always some other thing that's keeping them from, uh, from pursuing it. Um, you know, you, you wait for that perfect opportunity. You wait for that, um, you know, that moment or that, uh, that idea. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, 10, 20, 30 years goes by and they're they're still waiting for that perfect moment. And in some senses, this is sort of what's happening with Roland. Um, he's somebody who has clearly done well for himself. You can sort of see that um, he maintains sort of this day job at the, the gaiety, um, but has clearly been able to, substan uh, to establish quite a bit of, um, of material wealth. Uh, and this has come through these side jobs for Lord Timothy and uh, his, the current woman that he's entertaining, uh, Nicole the Fourth uh, Marchioness of Stanford. So, um, and you can even see, I mean, whether it's a university professor of English, let's say, who writes novels, or, you know, maybe somebody who, you know, I not everybody's had this experience but you know there's sometimes you run into people who you find out um, thank you very much for the host the eyes of sin um, but uh, you know you you could have like a co-worker and one day you're you know you're you're talking with them or something. Actually, if you guys have seen, um, it's going to be another writing example. I apologize, but uh, there's the character Ken Cosgrove in Mad Men. If you've ever seen this, and it's you know a it's an advertising agency, it's very macho, and Cosgrove winds up with this short story that's published in. I think it's Harper's or the Atlantic. I think it might be the Atlantic. Um, but anyways, it's uh, and he, it turns out that he is a fairly talented writer. So, you know, where some of these other guys are like writing science fiction or something like that, he's sort of writing these very intimate little, you know, little story. And he's discouraged from doing it later on in the, the show, but he, he winds up still publishing um, under uh, under a pseudonym. So it's a little bit like the, you could sort of see that, you know, Roland has his day job. And this is the funny thing, right? So many people who you sometimes look up to, maybe not, you know, superstars or something like that. I'm, I'm sure, you know, a Brad Pitt or a Russell Crowe doesn't have like a, you know, a, a day job other than acting. Um, but, uh, you know, there are people that you know potentially in your workplaces and you just do this double take where you find out it's like, oh, wait, you do that? You know, I don't know if any of Johnny's co-workers, uh, you know, say to him, is like, wait a minute, you're internet famous? You're the Johnny big time? You're the eyes of sin? Um, these are the sorts of things that you, uh, I don't know, like I've, I've always been, I haven't had it happen too often to me, but it's always been kind of interesting to, to find out that that person who I've associated as like the person I bring my computer questions to or something like that turns out to be, you know, 
very good at this really interesting occupation. And so this is sort of where Roland finds himself, is that he is, you know, a dancer, and he has been able to sort of rise above his station materially. But of course, he's also done so probably through some means which not everybody would want to to cross. In this case, you know, he's sort of relied on these increasing demands of, of people who uh, who make, you know, use him as a as a toy almost. Um, and of course, one of them has finally crossed uh, crossed the line into marriage, and we have no intention of uh, of following through on that. So this is the interesting thing. You know, it could be that uh, this story turns into one where having you know, maybe Roland is not the sort of person who will realize his ambition of change on his own, but actually needs to be pushed by the fact that his his former patrons uh, are no longer, you know, are no longer willing to support him. That they've, you know, he's he's dined well on the, you know, on the uh, the kind of the the undue attention that they give you know there's a there's an exchange um he's giving up more of his time and he's doing more that maybe he wouldn't necessarily have agreed to in in normal circumstances um but the the trade-off is is that he's compensated very well for it um but in this case this is a demand that goes too far and this is the thing i think there's a really interesting idea behind the game which is this like if you actually give in to this demand, well, it's not a demand, it's a request, but if you actually cross this line, you shut off the world of, uh, of the Mantis. You give up on all those ambitions, which I think is a really nice and interesting little touch. Um, you know, it's just the same as, as you know, becoming, uh, becoming established at, uh, at Glover and Glover, for instance. Um, so it might be that the story, story of Roland is that he's been able to through money or through other means has been always been able to sort of tranquilize the un- uneasiness that comes from not fulfilling this ambition of change and that it may require his uh, the loss of sort of his patrons or this uh, this opportunity to make more money um, before he finally starts taking this ambition seriously um, and of course what forms the uh, you know what forms this this um, this replacement takes, you know, whether he becomes a painter or goes to, to work at a regular job or something like that. That's a whole other question. But it's sort of neat. This is one of the reasons why I find Cult of Simulator so satisfying and why the, um, why the, uh, um, you know, why this game has a degree of replayability for me. Because, of course, there's different angles you can go. For instance, we are currently being pursued by the Weary Detective, but we've never once considered a, uh, a you know, a violent solution to him. Um, and, in fact, I'm actually going to see if I can get away with maybe not, not crossing the line into dastardly deeds until the absolute last moment. So... Hey, casual nothing. He does indeed lead up a complex life. Another thing that's funny thing here too is that there's actually a bit of consideration too in terms of my, uh, in terms of my cards here. So, I mean, what actions do I have available right now? Well, I have study available. So, do I try and improve my scholarship? Well, I've got two collections of essays, but this erudition is going to go away before I can do anything about it. Do I try to improve my passion? Well, unless I've got. One, two, three, four lessons learnt, and something more, which apparently... Neat. This is new. New for me, at least. Um, basically, you know, I've got a few trade-offs in terms of how I spend my time, but what I'm going to wind up doing here is I think I need to start... Uh, I need to start taking these things a little bit more seriously, so let's pick up the skeleton songs. Uh, poems of greedy delight composed by the possibly pseudonymous Arbella Dusk, the rumored heiress turned madam turned poetess. In Arbella's introduction, she explains that the book was to be illustrated, but that the Suppression Bureau would not permit it. She hints that the illustration still exists somewhere. The book is dedicated to Sir Percival of the Red Cup. And of course, the reason I'm doing that is because of my Grail Commission. Uh, now we also have some options here in terms of dreaming. So the question is, is there something that, uh, is there a reason why I might not want to use a passion? And in this case, I'm, I'm actually quite content. Um, oops. I'm quite content using the passion uh, in this case. So we'll go 
We'll go to the wood. We'll throw some passion inside for that. And I'll have one available if uh, if my, um, my other duties require it. Uh, but our main goal now is going to be to start trying to unlock some more of this lore. Uh, I've I've hit a bit of a uh, a limit in terms of what I can do with my my dancing. Um, I might be able to do something with the waking chant now. Um, I'll need to think a bit about that, but we'll see where it goes. All right, my benefactor finds me engaging. The performance is shorter than usual, but the conversations with the other guests and later just my benefactor go on well into the night. I come away with a handsome gift. A handsome gift for a handsome dancer. Five bucks. All right, let's go to the gaiety just to keep things uh, just to keep things going. We've got 63 seconds before uh, bad things happen. The stage awaits hot and clean and bare and bright. If I move the moves and step the steps and do what is required, they'll pay me. How are you both doing, Johnny Big Time and Isaacson? I am always happy to see you in chat. And I suspect as Americans, I know everybody gets angry when I go political, but my house. Um, I'm assuming both of you are happy, happy enough with the... Uh, the results of the midterms. I was thinking of re-traumatizing everyone and playing political animals. For those of you who are new to this stream, we played a, a fun little, almost like a board game called Political Animals on election night in 2016. And what was supposed to be this fun little light animal game and a talk of some of the political economy stuff that I've done just turned into this like hours long counseling session as everyone <laughs> was just looking on in horror at these <laughs> these returns so um i was slightly tempted to do a special cast last night but i i, I thought you know what i'm i'm gonna take some time off <laughs> Um, so the Viennese Conundra. The Van Drails describes odd events in Vienna, the disappearance of children, epidemics of parasite activity, animal mutilations, nightmares of worms, the activities of a charitable organization, the new Ligians, and the funds the bur that funds the burial of the poor. She proposes peculiar connections between these activities. All right, because I have the means, I'm actually going to keep uh, buying from Morelands. You can eventually exhaust it. So if I take time to sort the gold from the dross, the wheat from the chaff, the blood from the water, uh, if I buy enough books, I'll find something interesting. And Isaacson is fairly well, near convinced the election uh, wouldn't have turned out well, but it turned out better than you'd hoped. And you're prepared to curl up in a ball with some gin and cry. Sorry to hear that. So I was sort of hoping that I'd have an opportunity to uh, to really cut loose because um, restlessness is a is a bit of a a trouble. But I've got some ideas about how to handle. Oh well, there we go. Tonight I sense an opportunity. Tonight I could attract attention if I cease to hold back. If I commit myself more fully. So I'll dedicate my restlessness to that. And I am a lissom package of flesh and blood. Tonight they'll notice that. Oh, I know, I know what you meant, uh, Sin, so. I'm moving on, Miss Moreland informs you. My stock is largely exhausted and the Suppression Bureau are taking an interest. So it's goodbye. The last book is nonsense, but I've tucked some interesting papers into the back as a thanks for your custom. So I think we can safely put Moreland's uh, aside up here for now. Need a little bit of real estate. Um, somebody did uh, present a, an interesting idea where one of the potential legacies or another potential avenue that you could take would be to buy up Moreland's and become a, a purveyor of occult secrets. I think that's a neat idea. It definitely strikes me as one of these things which can sometimes be, and credit where credit's due, because I know the person who suggested that is, uh, is, is, in, you know, is, is likely to, to listen to that. If you want me to, to give you full credit, uh, let me know through the means which you normally let me know. The only thing that actually kept me from giving full assent, because I actually, I, I, I'm very, very charmed by the idea, but I also think sometimes that work is uh, this thing that keeps you from pursuing um, your journey through the Mansus. And I'm trying to figure out what ownership of Moreland's winds up doing for you. Because in one sense, I think it's a way of generating money. And you can sort of argue that it, it does that. Um, 
But I suppose in one sense, it's not like this game doesn't have opportunities to make money. So I'm just trying to think how I would balance. This might be an interesting uh, discussion for chat. Like, how would you incorporate ownership of Moreland's into this game as something that's more than just another job to work at? I mean, and maybe maybe it doesn't need to be that. Maybe it's just another legacy and it's another means of making money like uh, a contract at the Gaiety and such. And maybe that's all that it needs to be. I, I might just simply be overthinking it, but um, what what would you do to make Moreland, ownership of Moreland's a special, uh, sort of a special event? I'm moving on, Miss Moreland informs you. My stock... Oh yeah, sorry, we've already got that. And uh, Casual Nothing says uh, that would be that would be an interesting idea. A cult bookstore owner, it might be a good way to meet new people with occult interests. That's a good... Actually, that's so... Uh, make Maybe the legacy for an occult bookshop owner makes it easier to find followers. Because um, I tend to find followers is, is somewhat costly, but I also think that's intentional. Um, also, for the benefit of the person who's hearing their idea presented out, uh, that was uh, Casual Nothing says uh, that would be an interesting uh, interesting idea, so that's a thumbs up for your, your brilliance. Something, something, deep mystery, something. A dreadful souffle of di half-digested rumor about secret worlds and the irrelevance of contemporary morality, including a catalog of unlikely and probably invented debaucheries. If I've bought this from a shop, it probably means there's nothing else of interest left in stock. SE Knight says becoming an assistant to Moreland. That's kind of neat because it definitely gives you this idea of sort of an end state for your job. So you face unemployment uh, when the Suppression Bureau comes in and uh, and that dastardly, um, you know, that dastardly occultist buys up all of your, your, um, your books. Um, yeah, and by the way, I'm I'm not closing the door on on it being a. Uh, I'm not really closing the door on it being another job. I'm just sort of interested. Is there another way that you could incorporate ownership of Moreland's as another branch, along this you know this sort of journey that the uh, the game takes you? I'm sorry, I didn't read the text before, but sell something a minimal minimal value. This oddity is probably worth something, but it's hard to be sure. We'll eventually start buying some things from. Um, from the auction house as well, but for now we'll, uh, we'll pursue what we have. All right, back to the Mansus. So I've got a peculiar rumor, which if I want to generate notoriety, I can use to get another follower. But I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start visiting these areas because as it happens, for all the trips to the Mansus I've taken, I haven't gotten a lot of uh, secret histories. So I feel like that's my one of my more pressing um one of my more pressing options so let's go to the temple of the wheel oh damn it all right so we've got trembling air as the toes tap all is brisk and all is well a second order influence apparent to the perceptive instantly recognizable to an adept this can be used in some rites to summon minions. so in the wood beyond the walls of the Mansus, the jagged rock rears the petrified, sorry, rears like the petrified remains of a dancing giant. I trailed my hand along its flank over the eye signs and lichen and the crude graffiti of the lesser wood powers. I felt the thrumming of the wheel, uh, which, uh, sorry, I felt the thrumming of the wheel, which has passed. It has passed, but something continues. So. I will admit, so I didn't really put a lot of uh, I didn't really put a lot of emphasis on heart. One thing I like a lot about heart, I like the descriptions. So like just think, you know, trembling airs, the toes tap, all is brisk and all is well. Um, there's just something, I love the constant reference to dance. I love the percussigant. I love, there's just so many of these things that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, so I am, you know, I am forever Lantern, you know, Pope Clifton, Slee, Hanger On. Um, I, I will always forever love Lantern. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't really enjoy just the writing and the feeling that I get from heart. Like, it's in terms of just the writing and the, the sense that you get out of the things going on inside of it, it's probably 
it's probably the one that continues to delight me. And I really did not pay attention to it as much. Like, I always kind of feel that I undervalued Heart for the longest time until I really started paying attention to the lore and particularly doing the dancer. Uh, so that's been one, one nice thing. And I mean, that makes sense too. It's, you know, Heart is one of the more, um, the more, uh, noteworthy features of the of the DLC, so, you know, it's probably not surprising that I'm paying more attention to it. Uh, you're supposed to answer hired... Uh, oh, sorry. Um, Casual Nothing says a cult bookstore owner could take a more technical form of making the game interesting. Perhaps slotting it into work can give you an alternate way of studying to combine decomposed subvert lore. Okay, that's, that's interesting. So... I can see... I mean, that's actually, you, if you think about it too, that's another angle that you can take. So maybe you don't get the bookshop in order to make it a, a um, to make it a, a um, you don't get the bookshop to make it a, a money-making proposition. Like you're not buying a business. Um, what you're doing is you're taking, you know, so it's in some cases it's relatively easy to wind up with a large amount of wealth in this game. And so it winds up sort of being a money sink. And the purchase of Moreland's is sort of this, you know, outsized purchase that you, a wealthy occultist, can make, which gives you a leg up. Although I do sort of like this idea of a tension between, um, you know, a, uh, you know, the starving artist or the, the person, you know, who's not, not able to quite make, thing, make ends meet um and to to move on i don't know i i think i think there's some neat that's a that's a neat direction to go though to say that um you buy this big thing and it gives you another way of pursuing uh of pursuing your studies um you supposed to answer give health jobbers a job route do you wish normal labor job had a boss to kill <laughs> that that's actually a, that's a really funny idea um I, sus I suppose the um, the manual labor is more intended as sort of like you're you're out of options and your body is the only thing that you can give up, whereas or you, the, the only thing that you can give in exchange for money. Whereas the dancer is a more refined form of that. You have a specialized skill and so you're compensated better as a result. Um, so I think that has a another. Um, I think that's probably the the difference between the two. Uh, the red secret. Some words are sp sorry. Some words are spelled correctly only when the proper ink is used. Twenty-six delightful fruits. The seven chastisements. The nine gardens. The four regrets. Okay, guys. I know I just recently started. I actually didn't go to the bathroom before, and I kind of need to. So I'm just going to do this uh, right now, and we can we'll be able to go for a full uh, the, the rest of the cast without interruption. Um, but now seems a good enough time. So I'm going to just. F off for like 30 seconds and I'll, I'll be back. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, I had an absolutely enormous coffee before starting uh, starting the cast, so that's totally on me. Can't think of a unique way to of flavoring the bookshop as a legacy, but you love hearing these ideas. SC Knight says, labor job should let you become a blacksmith with enough lore and health, and you get a chance to forge tools and sell crafts. I mean, any DLCs? Many DLCs to come. I know we kind of have a forge forge ending already, but 
there's other things. It's kind of interesting too because I know. So I suspect when Weather Factory thinks about what to add into the game, it's very much in mind of, um, you know, what are interesting things for players to do in addition to some of these. Um... So there was a really interesting thing. I need to remember to put this interview up on YouTube at some point. I just need to stitch it together. Um, but there's this really interesting point that uh, Alexis Kennedy made in the interview on the GOG, uh, the GOG channel, um, who I've not heard from in a while. Uh, I don't know if I did something to upset someone or I, my messages are like blanked out or whatever, but um, I don't know if slash when uh, things will, will happen there next. But um, the, uh, yeah, so if you're from the GOG channel, reach out i'd love to hear from you <laughs> um but you know he, he sort of talked about the scene from blade runner where roy batty faces eldon tyrell and uh he wants his life and he's like hey you can try this thing and he's like nah you can't do that thing because then this happens he's like yeah but then you could do this and he's like yeah but if you do that then this thing happens I was like, well, then you should do this to, to counteract that. And he says, well, you could do that, but then you would die. Um, and he kind of gave that as the example in terms of uh, what it's like to get player feedback, because it doesn't necessarily mean, and this is true. I found this, by the way, on the feedback that I got for a paper that I wrote at work. Um, and I think this actually, he's got a thread on feedback if you've, if you've not checked out his Twitter. But basically the idea is, is that you are very good at identifying when things don't work for you. Hey, Le Chauffleur. Um, so, you know, when people tell me um, on a paper that I wrote, you know, you should do X. I almost always ignore the you should do part um, or the X part, depending on how you want to think about it. I do, however, listen to the, I get what I think is really being said, which is I am upset. <laughs> this thing is not working for me. And what I need to do is I need to figure out where I lost them. And part of that is parsing through what, um, what's getting at. So a really good example of this would be for those of you who are watching on um, Monday, you know that uh, SETI has become sort of interested in productivity. And so it was a paper that I was writing on productivity and somebody gave me the feedback of there's lots of negatives in this table, negative numbers, so negative productivity growth rates. It's, and it's, in their words, very troubling. And if I was in a particularly malicious mood, or if I wanted to feel very good about myself, I could say, ha ha ha, this fool doesn't understand productivity. Um, you know, th th that was the result, you know, if, if you believe the model that I'm using, or if you believe the very non-controversial assumptions that I, I make in that paper, um, you can't change the numbers because they trouble you. That That is what's happening in the world. And it is better to talk about why those assumptions may be violated than it is to say, oh my God, this, this conclusion, I don't like it. Get rid of it, please. Um, but my paper's not gonna be any better for that. My ego is gonna be better for that. And so what I needed to realize with that feedback was, um, and I will head on pause in a minute, but I, I wanted to talk about the next couple of moves I'm going to make. Um, and this is going to relate back to the, the Alexis Kennedy feedback thread. Um, the lesson that I needed to pull from that feedback was, I'm seeing a negative number uh, in terms of productivity. And I, you know, so I, I can say, ha ha, this, you know, this moron who, who thinks, thinks he's an economist and is a discussant on my paper doesn't even know this subject well enough to understand that, you know, a negative number is perfectly plausible and perfectly acceptable in a paper like this, you know. He's clearly just saying things because he wants to say them. All of that, by the way, I think was true of that individual. 
Um, I like I, I. He strikes me as the kind of person from my interactions with him that he, you know, he's that guy in the class who raises his hand so that he can offer an opinion during question time. Um, oh, I, I, I would gladly be, <laughs> I would, I would gladly. Uh, write the um or not write but i would i would, I would gladly consult for free of charge for the economist legacy <laughs> you have to be an actuary at glover and glover <laughs> um but yeah so like i had every reason in the world to dismiss this guy's comment as being driven um as sort of showing off and a product of the fact that he doesn't understand but there's a very simple point to be taken uh, from that that comment, which is, if in my introduction, where I actually took a lot of effort to explain productivity to a non-specialist audience in, um, you know, to terms that maybe like somebody with just a high school education, they might find it a little overwhelming because it's, you know, there's like Greek letters and, and you know, stuff in the equations. But like I, re I really did make an effort to make it something that people understand. And the people in the like the instructors in the class said is like I actually finally understand how this growth accounting thing works, which is great. But the important thing that came from his feedback was, you know, I spent so much effort in making this understandable to people, and yet when he gets to this table, he feels that it is not, you know, even if he was motivated by pure malice, he feels that he would not be laughed out of the room for saying, you know, there's too many negatives in this. I mean, it's, it's like if you've ever seen the movie Amadeus, it's like, it's too many notes. Um, it doesn't really work. Um, but that is a bit, well, at least I took that. as I took that as a big signal for saying that if somebody has read my paper up to this point and they don't understand that a negative term so what if you're interested what a negative term means basically is that um output did not increase as much as the factors of production so we added more labor we added more capital to the economy but the output the output did not grow proportionately which means that it was potentially used less efficiently than what it normally would have uh, been used and so we call that a negative productivity growth because things were not used as productively as they could have been or as they had previously been uh, as another way of looking at that so if that part isn't clear from reading my paper then i should be making my paper better i should not be making fun of the person that is, has given me that uh, that insight and so i you know i'm obviously sort of writing a check for mr kennedy to cash <laughs> you know this may not exactly be the way that he thinks about feedback, but I get an impression that, uh, you know, hey, I got a good idea for a game or I've got a great idea for a new Cult of Simulator later DLC is kind of like that. Um, and I've, you know, I, I fall into this trap in terms of my, my feedback as well. I sometimes get prescriptive in terms of what the solutions are, but what am I going to tell Weather Factory about their game that they haven't already seen? They've been living with this for a year. Their livelihood depends on this game. They are going to put far more care into all of the details here than I do, which is why I'm sort of interested in this discussion in terms of saying is like, hey, how would you guys make Moreland, the ownership of Moreland's, how would you turn that into something in the game? Uh, do you feel that it would be a source of funds? Do you think it would give you access to another research idea? So on and so forth. It's not that I'm, you know, I, I don't think that there's going to be some like form that I fill out. It's like your players demand dot dot dot. You know, if you want to do that, I'm sure you can go to the Discord or, or you know, maybe don't send your game suggestions to the support email, although I know they're very happy to hear from their players. Um, but uh, it is always kind of interesting because it's it's a nice little way of gaining some insight in terms of how people think about the game. So even if, um, you know, I don't really have any ideas that I think would necessarily be, um, you know, I don't necessarily think I have the idea that would, you know, quote unquote, make Cult of Simulator better so much as I can say, hmm, when I do this, I expect this and this other thing happens and I'm not so sure about this other thing. Um, those are the, the things that I tend to bring in, but I'm really, I'm actually genuinely interested in how you guys wind up, uh, how you guys wind up thinking about it. Cause I, I notice that I sort of already know my perspective on this game is, 
very much a function of my own maybe life experience or my own interests. Uh, and it's just so interesting to see other people's sort of ideas in terms of where they go. Like, I don't think I would have thought of, you know, buying up Moreland as a, as a potential avenue to take. But clearly that got a bit of imagination going on here, so. Oh, now I'm curious what Eyes of Sin said ha ha to. Okay, so the thing, uh, next plans that I'm going to do, I've got uh, my opportunity to do a Grail commission. So I've got uh, 118 seconds at the Gaiety Club, 120 seconds. Uh, for Nicole. So in this case, I think I'm going to do my Grail commission now and get that out of the way. That'll also help me get some Spintreya, which I'm short on. Uh, and I've got some reason available. So we'll hammer that out. We'll write a brief treatise on the lore of the Red Grail. And this is the first time I feel that Roland has sort of stepped outside. I mean, he's done some painting and all of that. And that's just, you know, when things get stressed out, you know, we'll maybe just hold back and, you know, and do, do a little painting. It's not that Roland's, you know, Roland takes a holiday every once in a while. But this is the first time we said, no, I am going to pursue this... Um, I'm going to pursue this, uh, this, um, this path, uh, now. I was saying I was interested in, um, I said I was interested in some secret histories. But the alternative could be... You know what? I really do like reading these new texts. So Vendriel describes odd events in Vienna. We read that recently. So when the individual K attends the meetings, black dogs are sacrificed and quartered. Don't read that, Johnny. Um, when the individual M is in attendance, black mares are found with their throats slashed. I propose that these sacrifices are not necessary, but that our legion friends may consider them fitting. Herewith, diagrams of the mutilations. If that doesn't give me a winter or a dread, I don't know what will. And let's take a quick trip back to the Mansus. I think I can afford the passion. Now I pass through the bar scarbark trees. The moon passes behind branches, though her fingers remain in my hair. I am stumbling over roots now. It is tempting to drop to all fours to avoid the low branches. Pale wings move deep in the night. Uh, one thing that I am a little interested in with this somewhat not non-violent playthrough is that because... Um, the auction, total lack of interest. No one is impressed. The auctioneer's gavel bangs. My item has sold, but for some so trifling as to not be worth recording. And I do have bleak thoughts. I don't think I have anything that will turn into, into something nasty. Um, uh, sorry, I was something I was going to say. Yeah, so one of the things that's so interesting is that the, the detective is starting to gobble up my mystique. And so, um, I sort of rely on that to be able to make some money off of my paintings. Sylvia. Sylvia lost an eye in the woods when she was nine years old. Every year at Candlemas, she returns to the place she buried it. All right. So I think I'm going to have a chat with Dr. Redeem to get a commission first. And then we consider what my other options are. Yeah, everybody mentions Bob Ross when we talk about the painting. I feel like I should do a Bob Ross playthrough of Cultus Simulator. All right, speaking of secret histories, Dr. Ibn Abel Adim called the Alapine has offered you a commission. He would like you to provide him with any information you can assemble on the secret histories of the world. You'll need to find a matching lore fragment of at least level two to complete this commission. Very well. Uh, in the meantime, let's go straight for recruitment. So, oop. Yeah. All right, so bad luck for me. Let's see what's available at Oriflam's. All right, I'm going to go for the cheap occult scrap just because I, I do kind of need to start getting some uh, some of these, these things locked in. So I walked in the wood last night and the scissors worked in the distance and the furred things cr uh, crammed my mouth and swarmed my ears. I felt an old urge to drop to wolf fours and nose among the roots, but I remember that I walk upright by day and I uh, know file and fire and steel and words. And at last I found where the velvet had concealed a secret on the tree bark beneath moss. I read it, and then with the tips of my finger, uh, read it, 
I read it then with the tips of my fingers, and I think now that I could write it in full. So, I think that was worth the passion. I'm gonna go straight for more, uh, more Mansus investigation. I have finished the manuscript. Oops, I need to need to better organize myself. And I may want to um, I may want to try and write that secret histories, but let's not neglect my patrons. So to satisfy my benefactor, I'll need to exert my abilities and ensure that I look my best. That always has a cost. So we should still be able to make the Gaiety Club after uh, after this performance. All right, bid in an auction so I can get another collection of essays. That will actually allow me to go for a higher level of scholarship. So I'm willing to put a little bit of money in, into this. All right, the Viennese Conundra. Uh, Medusa's riddle then, I choose to render as what is not seen. There is another riddle, one that I have heard rendered as what may be lost. I will delineate some historic attempts to answer it. These are in themselves, uh, sorry, these are in themselves in some sense sacrifices. So that is neat. I think some of you guys may remember what uh, what these riddles are. And this says an Ecdysis parable. The Ecdysis riddle is what may be lost. Each Ecdysis parable is an attempt to answer the riddle. All right, so I am slightly curious if Moth will take me. No, Moth will not take me any further. Um, and I don't think Heart or Grail do the trick. Nope. I think it's white that I need for the next uh, the next level, but I'll I'll figure that out in a in a minute. Speaking of study on the white on closer investigation, the work seems to be a theory of aesthetics, or perhaps a set of warnings about the dangers of paintings. Painting, not paintings. Okay, old and happy far off things. Moth finds light in the dark and so do I. We've recruited Sylvia. Sylvia has detailed knowledge of the roof ridges, of the river at low tide, of Irish whiskey and conjuring tricks. All right, so if I want, I can, um, I can try recruiting a few more of these people, but the main thing I was trying to do was just to make sure that I've got the names inside of uh, inside of the um, the cult. So let's keep chatting about the secrets of the world. Oh, you know what? I could have actually fulfilled the commission, but I was a dummy, so. That is indeed a lot of books, uh, Nepkros. I think one of the ways of sort of reading the situation that I find myself in is that Roland the Dancer is a little bit of the person. I guess the question is, do I really want to spend two... In this case, I do want to spend the two funds on a collection of essays just because it will give me the... Um, the, uh, the, the skill bonus. Um, We've sort of taken this idea that Roland is the sort of person who, you know, they might even have the talent to do the thing that they always talk about. That they're all, but they're also always waiting for the, um, like the the best moment. You know, it's this person who's always worked at. You know, maybe they want to. You know, they want to find a job at a recording studio or something like that. And they have an opportunity for like an internship, but. You know they've got a they've got a job at Starbucks that they know they'll have as long as they want, and so because they know that there's the certainty and that the internship is only a short period of time, they never actually pursue uh, the opportunity. That's such a mundane example. I'm very boring, <laughs> but um, that's sort of how we've been been talking about. It. So you know, Roland does have um, a lot of material wealth as a result of the you know the exchanges with uh, with his patrons. But um, he hasn't necessarily translated any of that into pursuit of his, uh, his goal of change. And this has been a source of some distress for him, so. Uh, also, 
Lord Timothy no longer sends me his little notes. So we're basically going to be rushing for our call at the Gaiety Club. For whatever reason, despite my best efforts, my benefactor does not seem interested in me tonight. They do make an effort to bid me a courteous goodbye, but their customary gift seems like an afterthought. And after all that effort... I think this is, by the way, one of the things that I like the most about the, um, the benefactor uh, part is that no matter how hard you try, um, there are simply things that you cannot... Like, sometimes you just can't... You can do everything that they ask of you, and it doesn't... It doesn't turn out. Um, it's depressing. It's, it's you know... It's something that is really awful to have happen in life. <laughs> but I sort of like that... And actually, you know what? This is one thing I don't give this game enough credit for in terms of my discussions of it. I kind of like the fact that this game does not shy away from the unpleasant things in life. And they may be represented in cards, and they may be represented in terms of things like... Um, they may be represented in terms of things like, uh, you know, these abstract ideas of occult societies or a, a, a magical dream world in the background or something like that. But, you know, on the Steam stream, I talked a lot about how I saw a lot of parallels with the, um, you know, with a streaming world. And this I, this is a little bit of an artificial example. I actually can think a little bit more of things that have happened outside of stream that make me feel this way. But especially... Actually, here's a great example. So first of all, if you guys have not seen him, Johnny Big Time is an absolutely incredible streamer who is a lot of fun to watch, and I don't think I'm ever going to be able to convince him to play Culta Simulator, but I'm going to throw the gauntlet down now and say, Johnny Big Time, if you will play Cultist Simulator, I will gladly be the one to buy you a, uh, a copy of it. You, you need not spend any money on Cultist Simulator so long as, as you, uh, you do one stream. <laughs> but I will definitely say Johnny is an incredibly entertaining guy. No matter what he's playing, if you dislike the fact that I sort of tend to put the game on pause while I, I develop a thought, Johnny's a lot better at kind of keeping the action going. Uh, he's got an incredible wit. He's got a great personality. But one of the reasons why I was bringing this up is that Johnny had somebody stop by his cast. And I, he was actually quite apologetic for this. Um... And I don't think he needed to be, but basically there's some people who kind of come into channels, especially newer casters, and they sort of do this follow for follow thing. Um, and that's a terrible way to build a community. Like people should, ideally what you should want is you want people to come in to the broadcast and, you know, you want them to dig your stuff. Doesn't mean that they can't give you useful feedback. I do actually get some useful feedback from people. And again, sometimes it's like, you should play the game more. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but don't you appreciate that? You know, I wouldn't quite be able to go into the depth that... Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I heard it. I, I, I was going to tell you that I thought you were... I, I thought you gave a little too much up, but I don't think it's a bad thing to try and build bridges with people. I actually thought you handled that relatively well. I just don't think you needed to call yourself a jerk in that case because he was behaving unacceptably. Um, but I also think, you know, sometimes it doesn't hurt to... Like, maybe I have ego problems. Like, I, you know, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world to apologize and, and uh, smooth things over. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, pe I understand, you know, everybody wants their channel to grow. Uh, and believe me, I've not forgotten the 2,000 follower thing. I just have a lot on my plate. And it's, it's I, I'm going to do something special for you guys. And I want to make sure that I do it properly. So it's going to be, I'm going to try and do it before the end of the year. But I'm, I'm, I'm working real hard. <laughs> um, so... Follow for follow is a is a really terrible system, and I wish people would stop talking about it, and uh, that they would focus on growing their casts through basically what Johnny said. You know, stream, have a good time, let people know you're available, and you know your followers will come. Uh, I think that's the right way to go about it. Um, 
and the guy did actually hang out and you know to to their credit um they they took johnny's advice and they were seemed to be reasonably pleasant to have inside of chat now the thing is is that um whether you're at that level or let's say that johnny i mean johnny's got a channel of his own he might want to see it grow um there is a tendency and i mean whether it's people who i've spent some time off cast with or you know for whatever reason there's sometimes something you want from someone um whether it's their attention or their follow or their sub or something like that and especially in the case of the benefactor like let's say it's somebody who subs to your channel um and they've been a sub for a little while and they're like okay you know you know i, I really wish that you'd spend some some time doing x and so they do you know you do x and then you know they ask again and they ask again and all of a sudden like you notice you're spending a few hours a week or you know or maybe even more satisfying this individual and then you know you get some we don't actually get the the notes from people in terms of why they unsub but i think in patreon you do and it's like they unsubbed it's like unfulfilled promises or something like that and it's you know you really do feel in moments like that it's like but i did everything you wanted like why did you do this and you feel like you've wasted time um and they've captured that beautifully in the benefactor system like you can i think this is one of the biggest things about those kinds of relationships is you can do everything right and somebody still just throws you away or they still just you know you know just because they're bored that night you know uh it doesn't count and um i sometimes really worried sometimes that i treat people that way and I, I i do my best when i can like i really don't want people to feel like they're under pressure to be there at the you know in the heat of the moment or something like that um i also don't like being neglected so i try to balance those two things but um you know that it, that is a really terrible feeling if you and i think most people have done that whether it's a romantic relationship or it's you know a commercial one in terms of being a streamer or anything along those lines like i think it's one of the, i think the thing that i like about it is it's that thing that broadcasters don't talk about everybody has got at least one story of where they really tried or you know sales is another great example i can remember when there were some sales I wanted to make and I could have sworn I had them in the palm of my hand is like, I want this so bad because I put so much effort into it. And then they walk, I was like, I think I'm going to think about it. And I'm like, no, I know you're going to Amazon and you're buying it there. <laughs> um, this is unpleasant stuff to talk about. Nobody wants to be the one to admit Yes, I wanted something so bad and it didn't turn out and it sucked. <laughs> it's not a topic of conversation that comes up for all sorts of reasons. But Culta Simulator has it because Culta Simulator has a lot about life, including the unpleasant things of life. Um, and I think the thing about the dancer is it really, um, it really does... I think the thing for me is that I've related to the dancer a lot from that streaming perspective. And so I think of it as that person you wanted to get to subscribe and you bent over backwards and it's like the costliest subscription that you didn't get because you figured, you know, it's like you only get a portion of that $5 from Twitch. And if you had just gone to McDonald's and said, I will work exactly one hour at your place, you would have made more money than pursuing that that person to get the sub um yeah i mean i i i relate to that on that tremendous level and that's not to say by the way please do not walk away from this thinking that like i am stressing out about the fact that i don't have a chat full of like sub sub badges it's just a great example um uh it's it's a you know it's a decent example that is relevant to the context in which we find ourselves um but I think everybody can sort of relate to that and nobody will want to tell their story of that time they wanted something so badly and didn't get it because it's a little embarrassing, it's a little unpleasant, nobody wants to relive those those memories, um, but it's captured beautifully inside the game. So um, that's a, 
I think the biggest thing is that I don't give this game enough credit for the unpleasant things it puts inside. Ah, I need to keep going. Okay, I need to start going to the well more because that's the second time that's happened. Um, I spent so much time talking about my, my insecurities, so we'll skip over the lovely text just because we did read that uh, earlier in the game as well. And we will sacrifice our passion to go to the... All right, so we've got another collection of essays. It's going to take me a while to um, to properly uh, properly work this. I feel like I've messed up my locations, but let's take another trip to Oriflames and see what books we can get. We still have money. Uh, all right, on the white, Husher writes distractedly of his hatred of colors and his yearning for death. He hints at a great work he has envisaged or begun, where the palest of paintings will enthrall the world. He returns again and again to certain compelling phrases, which he claims are the secret words of winter. And the Sexton's Secret. Certain knowledge, it is said, can be expressed only through, uh, through a particular quality of silence. It has been suggested that one can read such knowledge with uh, only read such knowledge with one's eyes closed, but only by mischievous commentators. This is actually another one of my favorite bits of Lorelei. Uh, sorry, everything's my favorite about this game, but uh, I really do like that little... It's not even a throwaway line. I just really like the fact that um, you've got these guys writing these books... And it's like, oh yeah, these, you know, you can only read this with your eyes closed. And like, you know, shows it to his, his contemporary and you can kind of imagine him going. Um, and, uh, you know, and then it gets published and, and some idiot believes it because satire is dead. But you love it there. You love to smell the tears of employees on the packages that arrive at your doorstep. <laughs> You hate yourself for this, but when you play the game, you always want a collection of everything. All people, all items. No, I, I totally understand that feeling, uh, Neptkros. It's, um, it's a very powerful feeling. I mean, if you ever want, there's the... Uh... Oh god, I can't remember. I can never remember this. Oh, here we go. If you ever want to go to the console, you can uh, you can cheat. I gotta. I think for those of you who watch on uh, YouTube, there's somebody who was very personally offended by the fact that I missed the marriage option and that I had to go to the console to cheat it in. Um, I, I you know I already said what I did. I, I was actually so I was trying to, to pull them out in terms of why they thought it was specifically bad. Because one of the problems is I kind of perceived that as the same reason why people get like mad at games journalists it's like they're doing that thing that i want to do and so you know i'm going to criticize it but uh i i was actually genuinely asking the question to try and and get at the source of the uh uh to get at the um this sort of the source of the the anxiousness um but uh perhaps understandably they did not want to continue the exchange um, but yes, if you too would like people to tell you you're playing the game wrong, control tilde and uh, you get the console. Uh, and that way, if you if you feel particularly compelled to... Uh, all right, well, that course of the heart finished right on time. Um, if you feel particularly compelled to have a collection but don't want to actually go through the effort of, of reading the books, or sorry, of, of buying the books in order to obtain them. Another bidder, uh, I'm not going to pay up for poetry. All right, tonight I sense an opportunity. Tonight I could attract attention if I cease to hold back, if I commit myself more fully. Um, yeah, that's a that's a way that you can make a very beautifully laid out table of all the all the items. Of course, you need to find the names of the uh, the items, but there is a very helpful resource which I don't remember. I think it, the website's called the Fancis or something like that. But uh, it's um, yeah, it's. Uh, that sort of stuff is available, so. Hey, Ragnus Dome, you finally got to watch a stream of Culta Simulator. I'm very happy to have you here, welcome. Um, as is my way, I'm making little progress, although I, I sort of feel like I've been able to keep the conversation a bit more related to the game, uh, even though I'm talking about some life things. There's a little bit more. I think the biggest thing that I'm, I'm noticing is that people question the link that I'm making between the game and, and this. 
Um, so at least in this case, it's sort of been directly related. You know, my Amazon uh, story is, is an example of wanting something so bad and not being able to sort of, uh, sort of um, achieve it in the form of uh, pleasing the benefactor. I, I feel like people sort of understood that, uh, that connection a little bit better than me talking about, um, you know, productivity analysis uh, in, in Crusader Kings. I have no idea why I said the course of the heart finished on time because I've been sitting on a stack of vitality, but one way or the other, I will be able to overcome the sickness in 30 seconds without paying money. Now, uh, at work, what do I want to work on? Um, let's work on a commission because I can. Is there more than one romance victory? There is. Um, I, out of curiosity, Ragnus Domi, do you know who wrote the romance victories? Because I was a little surprised. I, ha I, I will admit, I did have an inkling that somebody else wrote them because the, the style fits. The, actually, the style fits very well, but it's... A slightly different flavor. I guess, okay, so it's like, I like whiskey. I know it. if I was more refined, I would be talking about wine, but I don't have that sophisticated of a palate. But whiskeys, you know, I like Lagavulin. I like Kragenmore. They're both whiskeys. They both kind of taste like poison when you first have them. But when you compare, very different experiences, both wonderful. But I think it's also just because I've been, like, just living with this thing for several months now. You know, it's just, you know, there's just that little, little hint. Um, it's, it's like the store page. Like, the Etsy store is really well written and really on brand. Um, but I think it's an author's voice that stands on its own. And I like it quite a bit, so. What Mance's creature would I romance? What a question. Uh, you don't know who wrote it. You're not very aware of game stuff and you haven't tried a romance victory yet. Uh, well, Ragnus Domi, um, at the developer stream, um, which are wonderful, by the way. I think the next one's coming up in a week or so. Uh, you can go to the uh, at Factory Weather on Twitter to, um, to check that out if you want. Um, they'll be better at, at saying the time. Uh, but I found out that um, it was in fact Lottie who wrote the romance endings, um, and the one that I got, I I rather I rather liked. Now it might be that maybe Alexis wrote that particular one, um, but I I don't know. I I felt it was it was wonderful and unique, and I had a suspicion that there might have been another writer, which did turn out to be confirmed. Wait, I said I was going to the well again. Ah! Well, actually, I can work with a particular... Uh, so this one is always an interesting one. I didn't quite appreciate the peculiar rumors until later on in the game, but so many things rise from the well in the wood. Last night, it was a swarm with wormy roots. The trees clustered and whispered. Perhaps they were welcoming the influx. I found a sleeping soul ensnared in the roots, and I helped them struggle free. When they wake, they will recall my face as I do theirs. So, peculiar rumor, this might lead me to someone I need, or it might mean something else entirely. Explore with a rumor to follow up on it. So this really neat idea here of I've met someone in this dream world, and I helped them out, and if I pursue this, but I, I only have a minute to do so, um, but, you know, you, like, think of, this is, a, you know, it's such a wonderful idea, it's not, you know, this wouldn't be the first time that this, this idea has been used, but, you know, you see someone in a dream, in a dream, and then you see them on the street, and they recognize you. Um, and this just goes one step further, which is, of course, you are a cult leader, and you have a special insight to this, uh, to this world, and they're maybe a fellow traveler, or maybe they're somebody who will be a good disciple. Um, but, of course, there's a cost for that. Uh, in the form of, of notoriety, so. What are the rumors aspects again? Uh, just so it's a uh, secret history uh, level one, moth level one, and it is an ingredient. So. 
The culprit, it transpires, is the audience. The surviving queens are directed to execute whatever audience members do not escape. A surprisingly lucid epilogue suggests the, correspo uh, suggests the correspondence of river names to historical events does provide clues to secret histories behind our own. And I don't think I read the occult scraps. So secret histories are layered beneath the one that we know, like notes in a rare wine. There's a detail from one of those histories. Exploring with a scrap of knowledge may uncover secret locations in the capital. So eventually I'll start pursuing those, but I do have a few other options available to me right now. So let's just carry on with our wood. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I need to answer the mantis creature. I feel like I should say the maid in the mirror, <laughs> but mantis creatures. I like the percussigan, but more as a friend. I could also disgust you all and say a raw prophet. <laughs> Maybe a Caligine? The, like, the smoky ones? The Sister and Witch. I know I can't get between them, but you can always go for a sandwich. <laughs> now, you know what? I'm, I'm sticking with Made in the Mirror. It's just that sense of danger. Um, okay, uh, what are we going to study next? Go for the burning of the unburnt god. Well, no, actually, I already have forge, but I don't have the ritual. So, study Jensen's burning of the unburnt god. Jensen's hypothesized as a pre-Zoroastrian fire deity whose rites were the rites of smiths, compiled by J. Rigglesworth Jensen, backer of Cult Simulator, uh, from oral traditions in rural Persia. Excuse you, Teresa, seeing someone. I thought she was the Balderama. Oh, sorry, uh, SE Knight uh, is saying so. All right, get my money back. So yeah, let's follow up. I, I do have a, ooh, okay, season of suspicion, 24 seconds. I think I'm gonna be able to get by, uh, track down a rumor, I suspect that at the end of this story, I will find someone who will hear what I have to say. So that takes 60 seconds. We should be able to avoid suspicion, so. It really is uh, the eyes of sin. By the way, I don't think I got to hear what you were uh, what you were hee hee heeing about um, or ha ha haing at uh, 9:37. So if you remember what made you ha ha at uh, at the um, about half half an hour 45 minutes ago, uh, do do let me know. <laughs> Come with me. All right. Stick the forge there. Got my passion back. I've got some mist. Oh, I'm boned. We got Enid. I should have thought about the fact that I was recruiting someone because this mystique's now going to go into the. Uh, this mystique is going to go into the. Um, the suspicion, which will translate into. Um, it'll translate into uh, it, that'll pick up the notoriety but if I have a heart follower which I don't because I am a fool well I have a pawn but I don't think oh yeah they don't they're they're the edge okay um, Enid speaks softly and sometimes her gaze doesn't focus on anything visible if uh, it may be that you've dreamed the same dreams uh, you may be able to recruit this acquaintance as a follower Okay, so I will recruit here because that's really all that I can do. Um, yeah, I think I'm just going to have to eat the notoriety on this one. Oh, nope, he's already considering the evidence. I'm safe. Oh, the Amadeus comment. Okay, there we go. Yes, uh, I got to introduce um, 
the Eyes of Sin to Amadeus, which was delightful. I have been trying to host the occasional movie nights with uh, some people. Like, not as a stream thing, but just with people who I, um, you know, I sort of know. Um, I was tempted to show Johnny Amadeus. I would actually like to show Johnny Amadeus. I just don't think I'll be able to drag Sin along for round two. Um, but uh, it's fun. How, okay, how many of you guys have seen Amadeus? This is totally unrelated to, to Cult of Simulator, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. I'll still keep playing the game. But I am kind of curious how cultured you all are. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got 59 seconds, but I don't think it'll take me a minute to... Um, yes, I will go for Nicole, because even if I wind up... Mm, even if I wind up with some extra time, I can always get my job back at the Gaiety. So we'll perform for the benefactor. My benefactor would be delighted if I'd offer a private performance for a small and refined audience. They'll invite me to dinner afterwards, of course, and offer suitable gifts in return for my time. Yes, the piano guy. Although one might argue that the play is not about is not about uh, Mozart. The ceremony is resident as thunder in a church. I know it well. I wrote it myself. Enid speaks softly, and sometimes her gaze doesn't focus on anything visible. She sees things that others don't. I think that's the same text. I think that's the only time that I've seen the, the text be the same. So my vertical strategy is not serving me well here, but I'm, I'm sticking with it. I'm not ready to abandon my, my, uh, my plan here. Okay, let's um, let's keep chatting about uh, about the secrets behind the world. Oh wait, hang on. So I think this is yeah not enough. So I was right about the white. I was just wrong about the amount that I needed. So probably traveling at night is the best option here. Um, do I read volume two before I read volume one? We have to have some standards in this cult. Um, well, I don't have volume one, so. Yeah, I can't talk about it. I need to study it. I am a moron. Okay, let's chat about uh, Thunderous Secrets. I very likely can, uh, Nepkros, but the basically what it comes down to is... Um, Oh yeah, we sorry. We've got a few things. Uh, you don't know who Amadeus is. Sorry about my ignorance. No, 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 no problem. Uh, it's Mozart. It's Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, there is a very famous play. Uh, well, okay, so famous you guys haven't heard of it. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a relatively well known play, um, but it was made like it was turned into a movie in the 1980s. So it's not bad that you haven't heard of it. Um, if you get a chance to watch it, it is a very good movie. Um, so most people know who Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is. Um, yeah, the, the movie is based on the play. I actually think it was also written by Peter Schaefer. So it's, it is actually a, a good adaptation of that play. Um, and what is, uh, what is, um, so interesting about it is that it's basically... The main character of the movie is the is actually the basic the court composer to the Holy Roman Emperor uh, Antonio Salieri, and essentially what it is is it is he is a gifted enough composer to understand when he is seeing sort of just world changing music, um. And he is very pious. He sort of dedicates himself to God in exchange that he um, he be able to compose great music. And of course, he's achieved this level of notoriety in the court of the Holy Roman Emperor. But then this prodigy comes in in the form of Mozart. And he's uncouth. And he has this, you know, basically supernatural talent. Um, but he is, you know, the exact opposite of what Salieri has, has been. And it is very much a, it's a, it's about him dealing with that and largely dealing with that in a negative sense. And what's so great about it is that I kind of know deep down, like, so from an economics point of view, I'm never going to be Kenneth Arrow. 
Um, and unfortunately, I've been born with just enough talent to be able to read Ken Arrow's work, or Darren Asimoglu, or any of these, like, you know, these, these great figures. I've been given enough talent to see how great this stuff is, but I don't have it in me to be able to produce something like that. Um, and so it is kind of this this story about how he how he sort of handles sort of his own not even necessarily mediocrity but in the face of, of Mozart uh, how he how he deals with that and it's again it's I, I think it's a, a wonderful movie um, and it's uh, again like it's one of these ones where nobody wants to think of themselves in those terms and that's why it's such a good movie for that because you you know, it's probably a story that we need to hear, um, but it's not necessarily one that's always pleasant to think about in your own circumstances. So it's um, it's pretty good. The only thing I'll say is that I originally didn't like it when I was very little because I thought Mozart had the most annoying laugh, and I believe that is by design. <laughs> but uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's it's a heck of a movie. Uh, I, I definitely recommend. I, I guess the the equivalent story is is that you want to be great at making games, um, and then you see Cult Simulator and you realize you'll never make Cult Simulator, so you get to dis you know, go into despair. But um, I know my talents aren't in game design, so I don't dislike. I just like playing this game. But although you know the opposites happened actually, a couple people who have been watching this have said that they are actually inspired to make games by by Cult Simulator. So. Um, I suppose the analogy falls apart there. Um, but I wanted to say something to Nepkros. Uh, so yes, I, I believe with the Waking Chant and definitely with the Merovine Idol, I can upgrade my characters. But essentially, it's um, I always like to think of them as trade-offs. Because, I mean, at its heart, this is the other thing that I, I learned in the, the GOG interview. This is kind of an idol game at its core. And so what... Um, Essentially, what I face is this trade-off in terms of how I spend my time, and of course, this is of course the this is a micro trade-off in terms of how I'm using these verbs, but it's also a macro trade-off in terms of my character's life and how they're going on. And so, the big thing is is that I don't really have a lot for my characters to do. Um, you know, it's not that I really need a lantern or a moth or um, you know what I really actually need at the moment is a heart. Um, but in these particular cases, I don't have a lot that I need from these particular characters to be upgraded as disciples. What I can use, though, uh, are more disciples with abilities that I can use. I can, you know, to, to get them to go out and uh, maybe get rid of some of my notoriety or something like that. So uh, the decision that I'm making here is not so much that I don't want to upgrade them or that I've forgotten to upgrade them so much as I have a better use for my talk verb at the moment. Um, and that's a trade-off that appears all throughout the game. Like, I think you'll tend to notice that the exploration uh, verb gets constant use once you've got a few expeditions underway. Um, and obviously, if I could, I would love like 10 more study verbs. Um, so, you know, uh, once Jensen is done, I'll, I'll do traveling at night because I sort of feel like I need to upgrade my winter more than anything. Um, but that's, that's really where this is coming from. It's more an idea in terms of what I think the best use of my character's time in the moment is rather than any particular decision saying that, you know, disciples are bad. I'm never going to have another disciple. So... You could learn, uh, lean into legacy class centered around that, something of a usurper. Oh, you mean in terms of like Amadeus? Yeah. And yeah, Ragnus told me, I mean, I, I, I am a big fan of Amadeus. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen it and you're looking for a movie recommendation, I do recommend it. Just keep in mind that uh, Mozart's laugh is a little annoying, but... Um... Okay... Jensen ultimately concludes with apparent reluctance that the deity was a goddess. He suggests that the gender may have been the cause of its suppression. The rites described are often eerie and sometimes grisly. Uh, so we've got the rite of the crucible soul. This rite uses an instrument of power to set the blood of fire. Fire is the lesion in the skin of the world. The assistant rarely survives unharmed. 
So we'll put this down below here. The Ardent Orison, uh, when we watch fire, what are we watching for? When we find it, these are the words it will speak. A word that sanctifies the change that comes when the seared skin peels. All right. I did say I was going to do Traveling at Night, so Traveling at Night is the annotated dream journals of Christopher Alopoli, sometimes called the only readable occultist. Literate, entertaining, bewildering. This is the second volume. There is an extensive discussion of the similarities between Alopoli's own dreams and those of the Emperor Elgabalus, who Alopoli regards as a dupe or avatar of the sun and rags. The white is west of the world, Alopoli remarks, and winter does not wait forever. So I think this might allow me to go through uh, to the next level of the Mantis. I can't remember how power, uh, powerful it is. Usurper screams at, ooh, that's a good point, actually. Uh, did you play this game to the point you actually remember which lore you get from the books? Um, not consciously, Ragnus Domi, but let me just take a quick look at what Steam says. I am now at 133 hours in Cultist Simulator. Uh, and I've also been playing since this was called an Ardent Prayer instead of an Ardent Orison. So um, I've done my time, I think is probably the best, uh, the best way of putting it. I'm almost certainly not going to make a uh, curtain for, uh, for the Gaiety Club. And we've got Tristan. Tristan dislikes distractions. Tristan gets things done. You may be able to recruit this acquaintance as a follower, and that is exactly what I will do later. Tristan is the one I met in my dreams. So let's go back to Oriflames for books. Also, in my defense, or actually maybe this just makes things worse. Um, all right, well, I don't need Gartside's Sanskrit reader, and I've got Fleeting Remembrance because I wasn't going batty. Um, I should also mention, too, that that's my Steam time in the game. I did actually spend quite a bit of time in Itch as well. So, hey, Dana, how are you doing? And Seti, good to see you, too. Uh, we mentioned, uh, we actually mentioned a little bit of the productivity stuff a little bit before, but more so in the context of getting... Uh, getting feedback from people so you didn't miss out on any of the any, any of the secrets all right um, tonight my benefactor is full of energy and I should be too oh hey I will make curtain call that's a good quote what is that from um, casual nothing unless of course you you know that's just uh, an original coinage, in which case, you know, shame on me for not uh, <laughs> not giving credit where credit is due. For whatever reason, despite my best efforts, my benefactor does not seem interested in me tonight. They do make an effort to bid me a courteous goodbye, but their customary gift, uh, sorry, seems like an afterthought. Okay, so let's go to the gaiety as quickly as we can. We're sick, so we're starting to run a little low on health, especially after we wore ourselves out with the benefactor, who was not as appreciative of our work as we were hoping that they would be. Oh, a uh, good question, Seti. I suppose probably an hour ago. Um, but it was, more so in, it was more so in terms of just an essay, uh, or not an essay, it's a paper I wrote um, at work and some of the feedback that I got from it. So it was very much more about feedback than it was about, uh, about productivity. So I uh, just wanted to let you know you're, you're getting, getting credit for your, your interests. I will say, so personally, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea when I talk about some of my, my academic interests and such. And I, I will admit, like, I don't always do a good job of describing like what's actually going on in those kinds of studies and it is because you know i am a little conscious of the broadcast uh and it's sometimes like you know trying to to explain this stuff while playing bumper cars um but uh i i will say one thing i've liked uh about seti is um you know it's just like straight so streamers actually this is one thing that's um let me find this tweet, because this is someone who I wish I'd found earlier. I think it's Emily Buck Williams. Oh, sorry, Emily Grace Buck. So she made a really good point. And I think she needed like she I think she needed to issue a clarification, which I don't think in my view wasn't necessarily
Okay, I, I don't, um, I don't have it in front of me, but hey, Ego Karen. Um, to be honest, college would have been way more interesting if elections had taken place in bumper car. <laughs> very, very true, Isaac Kleiner. Um, not sure how much I would have learned, but <laughs> your point is well taken. Um, but anyways, it was something to the, she basically kind of pointed out this, this, um, observation. I'll just read the, uh, the text here. El Gabalas found his way to the white door at last. Thankfully, uh, speech can't pass the, sorry, thankfully, no, the white door at last, thankfully. Speech can't pass the white door, and honestly, El Gabalas never had anything interesting to say. I tried to follow in his footsteps, but I never learned enough of the white. I suppose I'm thankful for that too, but here's what I do know. So again, this is one of the things that's nice. This is more than just pretty words. Like, this has basically told you how to advance, um, but it's also told you in a way that you actually need to fill in the blank. And of course, I've just got my second white for that. So uh, because I have the erudition, I'm actually going to take a chance and combine these two. So it's not really a slam dunk that this is going to work, but I'm going to take a shot. So these are the words which chill the air and drink the color of my skin. Um, but yeah, so basically she said something to the effect of she was not entirely happy with the idea of uh, sort of the label of gamer in the sense of... I'm doing a really bad job of summarizing your thoughts, by the way. So if you, you know, this is on me if, it, if I say something, you know, appalling. Uh, but basically, it was the idea that you are you are more than just the games that you play or the product that you buy. Um, and that it might be a little bit healthy. You know, you can you can call yourself a gamer. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But it does seem that sometimes we maybe go a little overboard in terms of, um, you know, the singular dedication to this one hobby. Uh, tonight I sense opportunity. Tonight I could attract attention if I cease to hold back, if I commit myself more fully. I think I will dedicate the passion towards this. Tonight they'll notice that. Um, you think it'd be fun if some of the romanceable characters caused you to give notoriety when you go out on dates? Oh, that's so interesting. It's almost a celebrity. Ooh. I have an idea. Thank you for that, Nepkros. There's a little something I'm working on. And that gave me a rather good idea. Um, by the way, I haven't read this yet. We perch on alarming Rietveld chairs in a windowless auction room with vividly burnt orange walls, waiting for the auctioneer to announce what he's offering. The reek of new paint makes the brain spin. Um, I can't tell you what that idea will be used for, but when I am ready to talk about it, I will do my best to make sure... I reach out and let you know what that was. You would have loved your uni professor to teach you over Cult of Simulator? I've, Cult of Simulator is the only lesson you really need of life, don't you? <laughs> um, tonight's lesson is about how much the dancer reminds us of our depression and insecurities. It can get a bit too real. This is, isn't this all of my Cult of Simulator streams, though? I sort of feel like I always just talk about my unfulfilled wishes. <laughs> Uh, Debellus Mirorum, I don't think we have that one, so... In Latin, an 18th, 18th century epic poem by the pseudonymous Solipstos. I felt their, uh, all their eyes upon me. Afterwards, I received a gift from an admirer. A little too personal for my tastes. Uh, sorry, for me to feel comfortable. But I can sell it in the second-hand market. Okay, so our contract is still secure. I think it probably makes sense to, uh... Go visit my benefactor again. I may have to pay up for it, but uh, I don't really have any commissions to fulfill yet, although we will be getting um, either Poppy or um, or uh, Jennings. Is Gamer that much different from Cinephile, though? Well, this is, I think this is the big thing, like like I, I, I would definitely count myself as a, you know, a great lover of movies because I worked in them. Like I, you know, I, when I'd go to the movies, I'd be watching how they were shot and I'd try to get some good ideas. So, um, Count Jennings, it is. I believe we can learn from each other. Um, so I, I, that was the source of her clarification that it was not. Um, 
It's not so much that you can't like these things or you can't identify that way. Um, just so much that there seemed to be something of a tendency to have that. Actually, you know, okay. I, to give her proper credit, I'll, I'll get the exact quote because I'm pretty sure I retweeted it. It shouldn't take me that long to to find under my retweets. Um, so her clarification was, I was super unclear yesterday, so let me fix that. There's nothing wrong with being or identifying as a gamer. I do too. Also, despite gamer culture acting like you're must, you must, you're not required to pigeonhole yourself into a place where gamer is your only or main identity. It's odd that because I said you're more than just a gamer, people got real mad at me. Though, uh, sorry, got real mad at me though, which uh, kind of proved what I was saying about gamer culture, trying to emphasize that gamer should be your main only identity label. Just food for thought, I guess. Just be you, be every facet of you. If gaming is your main thing, cool, live your best life. Don't let randos on the internet stop you. Uh, but if you are multifaceted or want to be, do the thing. Uh, which I think is a healthy attitude to take because my view of this is that games are a heck of a lot better if you have outside interests. You know, you can only play Civilization so many times before you go and find out what a hoplite is. You can only play Hearts of Iron 4. So here's a fun... Okay, I'm not going to tell you guys... Um, I'm not going to tell you guys what these are. If you're interested in World War II at all, one, ask yourself if you know what War Plan Red and Operation Unthinkable are. And if you don't know what those are, you have a very interesting Google search ahead of you. Or Bing. Let's be, <laughs> let's be egalitarian about this. You could also search that on Bing if you want. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the point that she's making is actually a fairly healthy one. Because in my view, games just simply get better if you have outside interests. Um, if you... Uh, if you, so, like, if you like Hearts of Iron, there's nothing saying you, you know, you can't love Hearts of Iron and spend thousands of hours in it. But if you also read, you know, I mean, Omar Bradley himself has written books, like, you know, um, or at least a book. Um, you know, or there's Toland and and um, his you know his account of Japan. Like there's there's very good writing on the Second World War. So if you like that, you can read. You know, again, Civilization was sort of that that first encounter with history that I had that made it interesting, and it becomes so much more interesting when you can. Like I said, you know, obviously I have lived the life that I've I have had, and clearly that time, despite really enjoying gaming. Um, the experiences that I draw from that make Cult of Simulator so meaningful for me are ones that are not directly gaming ones. And so, you know, I, I agree completely that you can be a cinephile, um, but, you know, The Godfather is a better movie if you've, you know, lived life and you sort of have some appreciation for the tensions that the main character is going through. Um, a lot of movies are better if you understand literature because there are references that get made inside some types of films that um you know you can appreciate the movie on its own you know i'm sure shakespeare in love is fun to watch if you've never read a shakespeare play but there's a lot of very subtle references to either shakespearean scholarship or the plays inside of it i believe tom stoppard did a rewrite on it where a lot of that got added in so um so yeah, it's that's what she was, you know, that's all that she was saying, and I think it's a it's a decent one, and I think Cult of Simulator is a great game to to reiterate that point over because again, if you've, you know, if you've not loved and lost, or if you've not, you know, had that experience where you have a great overriding passion that might not be fully realized because you have to do things like keep a roof over your head and food in your belly, or maybe you have a young one that you need to keep track of, or any dependent for that matter. Um, you know, there are just things that different people have experienced which will make the game more interesting as a result of it. So, 
Um, that's, uh, that's all that I meant. Anyways, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in chat, so hopefully I did not ruffle too many feathers, but I will, I will do my best to, uh, I'll do my best to, um, Uh, let me carry on. Uh, one thing you love so much is how having enough of an aspect checks a threshold and upgrades the effects. It gives much so much more weight to the card. You just hope that we uh, in the future you get effects where consuming higher quality ingredients produces greater results, like when you make a unique painting. That's an interesting take. I don't have a strong opinion on that, but that's also because I don't know those mechanics as well as I should. Um, I'm just going to skip over the ones that seem to be people exchanging with each other. I, my apologies if you wanted me to respond to that. Just let me know. Uh, you thought gamers are dead, get over it. I don't know that quote that you mean, uh, Nepkros, but I know. I guess the biggest thing is that I never want to take a general statement that's made in some kind of an article, and I, uh, I don't want to attribute it to uh, an individual. So obviously, if I'm quoting someone's Twitter account, I don't want to associate them with a piece of, of journalism or an opinion piece that they did not write themselves. Um, in that case, you def think Gamer is definitely much worse. Yeah, so just the big thing on that one is it's not crapping on gamers. It's just this idea that there is at least an aspect of gaming culture, and only in certain segments. Like, it's that's definitely not apparent inside of this chat. Um, but this idea that you're not a real gamer unless you spend X number of hours in it. You know, you read books, fill your mind with other people's thoughts. You're not a real gamer. Um, you know, or you play mobile games, that's not real gaming. You know, where do you think all the money for these other games are coming from, you know? Um, tribalism, so yeah, I mean, that's definitely a way that you can put it. I mean, if you if you really want to use the scary words that, that get people, in, you know, not very decent to each other in chat, you can say that there's a certain degree of gamer identity politics at play. But um, you don't necessarily need to use sort of charge statements like that to, to make the point. So I, I try to avoid um, using that. Bing is for port? I had no idea that it was. Uh, IMO, that story was overblown. Sounds like you're saying games are more enjoyable if you have the context necessary to appreciate them, which is true of all media. I, I don't disagree with that at all, uh, Isaac Kleiner. I just think the tendency is, is that because... The funny thing is, is that gamers really like to buck against the... And I'm speaking in general terms, which always can get someone in trouble. I think gamers have a tendency to dislike stereotypes, but have a, also have a tendency to live into them. So I think the thing is, is that um, there is a string in... Or at least a stream in gaming. And again, this is not a statement of everyone. But... There are some people who do actually live the stereotype of games being mindless distractions and they do neglect things like studies or other fulfilling activities in order to spend more time with the games. Now, I am not in a position to say when somebody is spending too much time on games or not. I'm just saying that there is some point, you know, between zero games consumed and quite literally every waking minute of a week you know no sleep no eat you know um all of that time is is gaming somewhere between those two poles there is some level that for an individual is too much gaming that that is the strongest statement that i'm making in in that sense um, and I think there's a tendency uh, for some gamers to do that. And I, I'm as guilty of this as anyone else um, because I was not a very disciplined student in high school once I knew that I was going to be working in film. And a lot of that time was spent gaming. Um, I stopped gaming when I was working in film for a while, actually, but um, that was mostly just because I didn't have the means of gaming. I've always been a PC gamer and I only had a Mac when I, I set out to find my fortune in Vancouver. Um... So, yeah, I mean, again, um, I think the biggest thing is that maybe the best argument that I can make is because so much of gaming is drawing from other media that having the vocabulary of understanding those, those re points of reference, you know, especially um, lots of games... Uh, have either references or take their cues from movies. An ability to relate at that level um, 
can enhance your experience of a game. But more importantly too, especially games like this one, you know, when you have your own experiences to draw from, you can actually pour a lot more meaning into these cards. Again, I look at all of these books and I look at these fragments of lore, and this is exactly like being in school again, where I have the textbooks and I have the understanding that comes from the textbooks. I could almost, I'm sure I could quote to you probably like the first two or three pages of Davidson and McKinnon's Econometrics textbook because I've read that introduction so many times in hopes of, of really just becoming a master at econometrics. Um, but I also appreciate that that little nugget that I get from Davidson and McKinnon is just one part and that I need to bring understanding from another book as well as understanding from my own life experience and some other things to actually make a worthwhile empirical project. Now, clearly that was not the idea that was at play when this game was made, okay? It's, you know, nobody sitting down to write these ideas said, you know what? I bet somebody who suffered through grad school, actually, I, I enjoyed grad school, but you know, somebody who went through that experience is going to look at this and they're going to know it's exactly like doing an econometrics paper or studying for an, econ you know, studying for an economics degree. That thought I can say with 90% certainty that that thought never crossed the mind of anyone involved with this game. That's something that's come after the fact. But once I look at it that way, I can't avoid looking at Cultus Simulator any other way. And I genuinely feel that everybody else who encounters the game is going to have their own experiences to draw from on here. But one of the challenges, of course, is, is that if your only experience of life is spent gaming, then that puts a much narrower scope. And so you don't quite feel, you know, you the same disappointment or you don't quite let your imagination soar quite as it could have otherwise. Um, and again, a lot of this is just a personal a personal preference thing and a lot of this is a personal choice thing. I don't necessarily know where the line of too much gaming is. Like I would not have some program that I would put on your all of your computers and say, nope, that's your quota for this week. Um, because what you do with your own time is entirely up to you as far as I'm concerned. But uh, but that's kind of that's more more where I was was going with that. So uh, all right, uh, there's a ton more chat going on here to uh, to, to carry on. So uh, Nepco says, do you think this game would be more more or less interesting if when you use when you began an action, you had to manually select which aspects are used to produce the effect instead of the computer doing it automatically? Um, I'm not quite sure, uh, Neptcross, because I have only had the one experience and I don't intuitively get what I would be gaining from selecting the aspects. I do think there's something a little bit interesting from a puzzle point of view. Like if you think about Tetris, like the, you know, the long blocks are the ones you always want to get, but sometimes you have to deal with like the, the zigzag shaped one. Um, and so trying to make things fit in a way so like even things like having restlessness come up at a time that you really don't want it and it's like oh wait i've got this great idea and i'm going to use it as a recruitment uh use instead i'm going to use it for recruitment instead um i like little moments like that and i i do sort of like the fact that sometimes you're given imperfect um you know, imperfect tools to work uh, work with um, what you have. Although I suppose in the case of aspects, it's like they're always on. Um, so I sort of see where you're going with it, but I'm not 100% sure if I can think of a situation where it would make the full difference in terms of my own play of the game. But this may be a lack of imagination on my own my own point. Uh, Seti says, I mean, we hope we don't need to argue in favor of doing anything else but gaming. <laughs> yeah. Out of curiosity, uh, System Drock, where are you from? So I'm from Canada. Uh, I more or less lived my entire life on the West Coast in uh, Kelowna for a while and then moved to Vancouver once I was basically of age and, and uh, pursued a film career. Although now I moved to the nation's capital um, for work. So, Seti says, one big difference that you can see is a cinephile looking at the most peculiar and innovative movie. The average gamer instead spends most of his time in purely mechanical games. Yeah, I mean, that's a broader statement than I would feel comfortable making myself. I think the experience of gaming is broad enough that I don't know. So, I mean, for all I know, Clash of Clans could actually be, you know, the biggest game 
uh, by player base. And so then I would say, well, does the, you know, do we weight the average experience on the basis of what platform's being played? Because I definitely think mobile games are as much of a game as any other one. Um, I don't play a lot of them. The ones I have played have actually been very good. It's it's one of these things where I realize that I don't even know what it means to be a gamer anymore because I don't play games on consoles and I don't play games on phones. Usually, I mean, like I li I really like Monument Valley and Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery, and um, what's another one that I played? Infinity Blade was kind of neat. Uh, XCOM, I played XCOM on mobile, um, but uh, but yeah, like I, you know. And more importantly, too, I don't actually think there's anything wrong with appreciating game from a game from a purely mechanical sense. Like, I don't think everybody has to play Cult of Simulator. I think they'd really enjoy Cult of Simulator, and I hope they, I hope they eventually get to have that experience. Um, but I mean, I spent a couple hours in Battlefield One yesterday, and it was like I was not meditating on the tragedy of the First World War. Like, I, I was, you know. And as a Canadian, you know, I'd love a Vimy Ridge uh, map, but it's not in there. Like I was, I was basically just trying to get my fancy hat for Battlefield Five. So Isaac Kleiner did a good job of identifying it as gatekeeping. And yeah, I, I the problem is I'm not, I, I'm, I'm so unhip that I use terms like hip. Um, so yeah, I, you, you, you said it better than me. That is gate, gatekeeping is exactly what I'm, I'm describing. Um, and yeah, and none of this is to say that this is uniquely gaming. But of course, that's the context where we are right now. And that's, um, you know, that's something I feel rather strongly for myself. And I think, again, the, the important thing to take away from um, from that tweet is more the fact that you are more than just the games you play. If you want to keep at that level, that's fine. Um, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. And I don't think anybody... You know, I don't think anybody involved in that tweet really is trying to tell you what to do so much as just remind everyone that that other group that's telling people what to do um, isn't the only voice. Um, I, I view that as a much more positive message than I think some people people did. Um, and again, for me, I just think like the biggest thing is if you want to get the most out of your games, I think it is important to do things like go to a museum. I thought stuff that was made up in Battlefield 1 for like just to make it a fun shooter. I went to the War Museum for the first time when I went to Ottawa. The War Museum is great, by the way. If any of you do visit Canada's capital, take the time to go there i was floored to see so many things that i thought were made up in battlefield one and there's the actual thing from world war one sitting there and like i just spent this time like i read every single bit of text i could find in that exhibit i desperately wanted to know more this is working in reverse, right? My enjoyment of the museum was enhanced by the fact that i played battlefield one but of course I was confronted with the fact that it's like, I knew that World War I happened, and I knew that Battlefield I was a game about World War I, but to actually confront the fact that things that I thought were artistic license were genuine things, and I actually saw a weapon that was fired in that war that I thought previously had been an invention of dice, was really cool. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that was the, um, that's a, you know, one, one example where my, my enjoyment of Battlefield 1 was enhanced by virtue of the fact I had an opportunity to go to a museum and actually see the things that are depicted in that game in person. Um, you don't need to be lucky enough to live in a, a city with a museum like that, um, because there are libraries, there's Wikipedia, there's all sorts of things, but, um, but that's the biggest thing is that you know I, you know I use a lot of gaming analogies. Um, I I find gaming a very worthwhile pastime and it's one that I enjoy. Um, it is one of many pastimes that I have and I enjoy. But um, and I know I've put the game on a bit of pause now, but I, I do want to properly address chat for this. And I've I've started to put myself a bit of a I've started to <laughs> to to um, impose a bit of a debt while I'm catching up with chat. So. 
Um, I may have to declare chat bankruptcy and like, uh, like, you know, blast through a bunch of a bunch of these ones. But uh, Ragnus Domi says, I've never felt comfortable to call yourself a gamer, and that's mostly because you like story-driven games, you like visual novels and point and clicks. So I guess that have to do, has to do with the fact that you're a lady. Yeah, so I mean, Ragnus, like, I don't know who has appointed themselves as the, the arbiter of what counts as a game or not, but, you know, I think... I think those are perfectly acceptable. I mean, it's even in the title, story-driven game, you know. Um, it may be different from StarCraft or Offworld Trading Company or something like that, but I think they are as, you know, they're properly called a game. I mean, just think of it, right? Like, I guess the biggest thing that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make gamers not sound like the stereotypical parent, right? Like, really, for all that these people who want to try and tell you what games qualify as a gamer like how is that really different than the stereotypical parent saying is like that's not music that's just noise no it's actually really cool and you know um i'm sorry that your tastes have led you to have such a closed-minded experience of what counts as music but i'm gonna be here rocking out like you know um that's kind of how I view it. Like, I think this is, you know, this is maybe what it comes down to is like, I don't like the fact that so many gamers just wind up sounding like, you know, some very past it, like get off my lawn kind of guy. I, I like, th there's a time and a place for that. And it's a little bit closer to the end of the life than at the beginning of it. I just think we shouldn't be in a rush to hit that state where we hate everything. So, um, and Ragnar says, uh, said he agreed. I feel the term gamer is mostly referred to to people who play F FPS. And MMO. Yeah, I mean, that's just, I mean, whatever you choose to call yourself is obviously, you know, sort of up to you. But I, I definitely feel, I definitely feel that um, gaming is big enough and interesting enough to accommodate people who like playing I mean, I like playing, I love playing Call to Simulator. I love playing Battlefield. Um, you know, not everybody will be like that, but if there's room for me, I, I think there's room for everyone. But uh, Siam, who I haven't said hello to yet, uh, speak of generalization, time to indulge in esotericism and forgot, forget there's a real world out there. No world, no generalization. Um, extremely popular pieces of me draw the biggest crowd, which lowers common denominator, which often leaves you in a swab of human behavior. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, this is one nice thing about Cultus Simulator, obviously, is that generally the, the audience is very pleasant, um, and you guys definitely indulge me in, in these digressions and things like that. Um, I will also say, like, I've played Dota 2, and I have definitely had those times where I've muted everybody in the, in the chat, but I've also, I do need to admit that I have actually had some moments where people surprised me in terms of being very decent. Um... So I try to keep the positive experiences in mind as well, because I think it's very easy to take that one negative and extrapolate, but the same doesn't happen for the single positive. But there is a reason why at least some companies, you know, Ubisoft and Blizzard, I'm thinking in particular, are, are taking fairly strong measures to instill standards in the community and because I, I think the experience has usually been when you know it's a wonderful ideal to say that we just let the community police itself because we believe in freedom but the fact of the matter is is that that does not always lead to the healthy ex experience for all players so I'm certainly not going to say I mean I know this always causes a little bit of of un, you know unease but I think there's probably somewhere between you know, some infinite content filter where, you know, anything that the party doesn't agree with is immediately shut down and having standards. I mean, we play games, right? Games have rules. We're capable of being able to accept some imposition of rules in order to have fun with a game. And I think you can argue that society works in a similar way, that there are generally some set of best practices that we've implemented, perhaps we may call them laws, that uh, tend to create an environment in which everyone can sort of achieve the most. My individual, yes, okay, so I'm sure my individual enjoyment would be enhanced 
if I was allowed to go to that gamer bar in uh, Ottawa, the Blurry Pixel, um, and I indulged in every beverage and I had a dinner and I could walk out without paying and they were forced to have me back. Um, I would benefit if we got rid of the rule that says, you know, they can they can come after me for not paying my bill. Um, but generally, society works better when I can't do that. So I think the similar thing works for for chats, and and I I think um, I think uh, you know I. Uh, there's there's a reason why these these bigger games are, are needing to to police a little bit but um, my my hope generally just is is that those things result in games that are basically more fun for everyone to play because I'm, I'm not entirely sure why you know you have to be a jerk to someone to in, to enjoy the game like do you keep the money at the end of the round if you know like is that why you're angry at someone it's you know it doesn't need to doesn't need to be so stressful. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, like play digital co-op card games. It's so niche. You sometimes see awful people, but we prune out our little micro community. Yeah, a similar thing happened to Spy Party too. Oh my God, there's so many messages I haven't uh, haven't read. So the reason you asked is because of the time you thought you were from Europe. It's almost 2 a.m. here. You must be leaving soon. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock where I am. Um, and obviously I've, I've kind of put a little bit of a, a, a hold on the game. So uh, let me just, I'm stripping through this as quickly as I can. People playing games on phones don't define themselves as gamer though, you'd think. I think it depends the person you talk to. Um, I don't think they define themselves as a gamer in the sense of person who only plays FPS or MMO, but I think that's a, a failing of our de definition of gamer. I think that's a failure of imagination, not a, not a failure of, um, of branding on the part of, of phone games. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. A small community of people who disdain common folk who call themselves doing God's work. Sounds like Cultist Simulator in a nutshell. Essentials of the Multiverse. Oh, I've got that. I've never played it, though. Um, you do feel you're a gamer even though you never played multiplayer or FPS games because you think the potential for the medium is the biggest of them all. You're always looking for an innovative indie game. Yeah, I mean, I don't even necessarily limit myself to indie. I just, if something's fun, I, I like it. So, um, but... You know, this is the nice thing. I mean, I like the fact, so this is, I talked to, I actually want to address something that I wrote in one of the blogs earlier because somebody said that they thought it was scary that uh, you could get Deus Ex on GOG.com, using the link below, by the way, um, for the cost, the inflation adjusted cost of what you could buy, the shareware demo of Doom. And the funny thing is I see that as a positive because it means that the cost of making games has gone down to a level at which Deus Ex costs less to make. And so in real terms, the price has gone down. But I can see where if you make your life, if your livelihood is based on making games, you want the price to go up. So I, I should actually probably uh, clarify that. Where was I going with this example? Right, uh, the bigger tent for everyone. Um, so yeah, this is the thing. Like as the price of games have gone down, it means that more voices come in. This is why I think Ragnus Domi is is perfectly uh, within a right to say that um, gaming is something that you know that visual novels and such should be included inside of gaming definition because um, these you know if you consider you know uh, this is going to sound a little. Um, bleeding heart for a bit and all i can just say is if you're offended by that like just get over it <laughs> like but um marginalized voices are generally not going to have as much access uh at least all things being equal obviously uh some governments and some programs are making an effort to try and dedicate funds specifically to those types of creators but generally if you are somebody who does not normally get financing for certain types of projects or you don't have the background that leads you to be in a position where you feel comfortable sort of filling out government forms for grants or anything along those lines uh, budget is an issue budget's an issue for everyone um, but especially if you're going out on your own you make a decision in terms of what type of a story you can tell and what kind of budget you have and visual novels do not cost as much to produce as an mmo and so as a result, if a particular type of story speaks to you, if a particular type of game experience speaks to you, it might be particularly um, 
you know, you, you may have more options inside of a certain genre, and that may not necessarily be because those game designers, the only thing they're capable of making are visual novels in the sense of their talent. It may be that it's the best vehicle for them to communicate the thing that they had inside themselves and that they thought would be a fun experience within the, you know, the confines of their budget. And so, again, as the costs of game engines and things like that go down, as the, you know, kind of these inputs decrease in price, that means that there are more games and there are better games that come out. Obviously, the Unity engine is capable of a lot of things right now that, you know, you would never have dreamed you'd get essentially for free, or at the very least of a nominal cost in terms of a... Um, the Unreal Engine, right? The thing that was that people made with Mass Effect. You've got a better version of the engine that they made Mass Effect with, and you can get that for a percentage of your revenues. That's a really amazing thing that's happened in gaming. And what that should mean is that more people are able to express themselves, which means that there is a greater range of games. And it, you know, it's not all going to be for everyone. I have ignored countless games that even if I wanted to play them, I would never even be able to find them again. Um, I'm still trying to, to find a way of getting some of these indies that give me keys to give them their due because I'm looking for the next, you know, the next thing that I fall in love with. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just one of these things where if we want to define gaming through two genres, um, then we're just basically missing out on the opportunity to have, um, you know, to have these more unique experiences. But more importantly, we're missing out on the opportunity to play with people. Um, you know, you can go to single player mode if you want, or you can just, you know, team up with your friends. But I don't, I cannot think of any game that has said we would prefer it if we had fewer players. Um, so and I think that's the cost of gatekeeping. I know it's easy for people to say it's like, yeah, well, I don't want a bunch of noobs ruining my game anyway. Well, it's like, well, if you're such a badass, then you're going to be match, you know, you're going to be in the matchmaking queue with somebody who is as big of a badass as you are. But let's face it, you're mad because you suck at the game and you want to blame the fact that all of these new players to the game are the reason why you're being held back. It's not true. Mad because bad get over it, or maybe just accept where you are. I was so disappointed to find out that Battlefield actually reports my skill to me, and I'm pretty sure, I actually don't know what the distribution is, I've never looked for it, but I know I'm probably somewhere near the bottom of the distribution. But boy oh boy, didn't I have some fun playing it last night, so. Anyways, uh, that was uh, definitely me getting on a soapbox for a little bit, so I'm almost at the end. Uh, Netcro's uh, turn-based strategy games. I, so I, I think you're talking about um, Sentinels of the Multiverse. I apologize. I'm reading it myself, but I'm not going to read it out loud. Isaac Kleiner says, you feel the same way about World War II after you play Battle Stations Midway, Battle Stations Pacific. They're both World War II naval RTS games, and you learn so much about the various battles of World War II basically by reenacting them within the game. Absolutely. That was Civilization to me. One of the first games I ever played and one of the reasons why I started reading history books. And that's true of... Uh, so, you know... The Send in the Zombies achievement, I know that some Canadians actually found out what the zombies were for the very first time because of the Together for Victory uh, DLC. So, um, Nipto says you love cooperative games more. It's taught you how to be less of an alpha gamer who controls others' turns. You get the thrill of losing or winning with people instead of beating people. Yeah, that's, I, that's actually one reason why I like co-op games a lot. I think games like A Way Out are really interesting uh, of course, the drawback for me is I don't always have people to play them with, so I don't get as much of a chance. Ragnus uh, Domi says, you know, nothing about games like those, but you feel like you got your explanations of that. Oh, yeah, sorry, you're talking about Sentinels of the multi uh, Multiverse. Uh, it's mostly noise organized. Sorry. Isaacson says, sadly, for every nice person, there's a toxic one in a lot of those games. Yeah, I mean, but that's what mute buttons are for, too. I don't like the fact that I have to mute them, but it's I, I, I at least like it when games make it uh, easy to... Um, knock people down. And I'm sorry, Alpha, I know you gave me some bits. I'm, I'm waiting to try and find it inside the, the chat here, and it's, it's not come up. So I'm not ignoring... That's the super nice of you. I'm just trying to find your message if there was... Okay, actually, I've got to it now. It was just the bits. If you are... If, okay, if you left, I feel terrible. Um, if you are still around, thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I thought there might be an associated message with it, which I would only understand in the context, but I realize now I was just too busy babbling to appreciate your contribution to the stream. I hope you forgive me, um, but thank you for that. I, that, means, that means a lot. 
Um, ba, 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 ba. Though you, yeah, Ragnus prefers to think that for every toxic person, there's a nice one. Life is balance. Um, Isosense says you consider your mother, grandmother a gamer. She plays mostly puzzle games and free cell type games. Uh, she plays them, plays games, plays them as a hobby, buys games she enjoys. She's enthusiastic about them. I actually had a bit of a reality check today because I, I was a bit of a, a whiner. Um, Isosin uh, got me to play Scrabble again, and I'm not really good at Scrabble. I feel like I take too long on my turn, so I did her a bit of a disservice, and I complained during the game, which is really bad for somebody who actually should be grateful that he's actually finally found somebody to play with. But she took it in stride, where we, she really should. She actually should have told me to F off, um, but I'm, I'm happy that she didn't. Um, but that's a, I, that was actually a great example of me letting my... Um, maybe my impatience with my, my lack of ability at, at getting better at the game, uh, turning me into somebody who's uh, was unpleasant to play with in that moment. Um, but that's, you know, that's another example, you know, so like where I'm sitting to myself is like, oh, I only play elite, you know, board games like Twilight Struggle or, or Distant Plane. It's like, no, like Scrabble is one of the most popular games, you know, so why, you know, why don't I figure out why I screwed up? So if I, you know, if I can play such complicated games and every, you know, not everybody, but once in a while I get a nice comment on my writing, you know, so, so, you know, hey, Mr. Badass, why, why aren't you able to handle scra <laughs> Scrabble? Um, so if you heard that sin, I would like to play Scrabble with you again sometime so I can not be as much of a jerk. <laughs> um... But yes, I agree, Ragnus. She does have a cool grandma. Uh, I said you need to get a 3DS one day so you can play all the Layton games. I have a, D a DS and I've got three Professor Layton games, which I enjoy quite a bit, but I think it's because he's inspired by Sherlock Holmes. Said he says you wouldn't say the price of games has gone down, more price points have been created. You remember playing lots of free Flash games as a child? I mean, my, my view of it just simply is that um, in real terms, the prices have, have gone down. Um, you may say that different uh, different price points have been created, but I think on a... So, like, one of the ways that... Because I used to work on price indexes, one of the things that we usually do is, like, a quality-adjusted product. So, um, like, what I would do is I would abstract gaming down to a product where you walk into a store and say, one video games, please. Um, and basically, we just rank all of the games after that normalization for quality. And I would say... With that in mind, um, the prices of games have gone down because the costs of producing games have gone down. The only thing that would have gone up is the cost of labor. Um, the cost of computing has gone down, the cost of software has gone down. Um, and the biggest thing is that because those factors of production are so much better, the labor is more productive, which is one of the reasons why their wages are going up and they cost more. So. The thing is, is that if you just take a look at the different price points, it's sort of failing to acknowledge the fact that probably if you wanted to play a game like Cultus Simulator at the year 2000 or so, you'd probably be paying 40 or $50 for it. Um, because there wouldn't be Unity. They would actually need to either buy or build a game engine. And that is not cheap. So that that's my view of that, so. Um, there's some amazing VNs out there you love Ever 17 and Remember 11. I actually need to do, there's a couple of visual novels that Eyes of Sin has recommended to me that I need to, to, to try out. Uh, Ragnus says some of the best VNs you've ever played are free. Uh, same goes for RPG Maker game. I played a silly RPG Maker game. As I just mentioned Doki Doki Literature Club. Um, just gonna be, I'm just gonna be jumping down to, oh, I'm at the bottom, okay. Uh, catching up, go, go, go. All good, man. Just glad to see the stream. <laughs> Thank you, Alpha. Um, ba, ba, ba. RPG maker games have their own pursuit of marginality, indulgent, and unnecessary, disturbing. Yeah, well, I think this is actually one thing about RPG maker games is that because they're so low cost to produce, uh, some people feel like they need to compete on shock value rather than content. Shock value... You know, it's the same reason why independent films usually have the leading lady take off her clothes, whereas um, main mainstream films like Marvel films just increase the special effects budget. Both of them are going for this level of, you know, excitement, but it is unfortunately cheaper to get a beautiful actress to remove her clothing 
than it is to produce a fully realized New York that will be utterly destroyed by the, you know, the fight between good and evil. Um, and so those aesthetic choices are largely reflected by the budgets. Um, ba -ba -ba. Scrabble isn't always the easiest games. Yeah, I know, as I said, I, I like spending the time with you, and I, I, I could have, I could have been better. Um, you dare to generalize a bit? Uh, nothing is new after Corpse Party. Uh, niche appeal of RPG Maker's games mostly just being perverted into. So I've not played as many RPG Maker's games. I did play the one by Davy Reedon. Um, uh, which is really the Keanu Reeves one, which I thought was really funny. Uh, and then finally, Seti says, but at the same time, the same game you've made, you'd have made in Flash, you can make them in Unity instead and charge for them AAA are the biggest production value products in the set price. All other are almost Gaussianly distributed below that. So the biggest thing that I would say though, Seti, like compare The Binding of Isaac, which is a game made in Flash, even against Cultus Simulator, which is by no means like, this is not pushing the envelope in terms of Unity's capabilities. Um, like I, I have worked in Flash and I've worked in Unity and the fact that you could like Unity you work faster in, and this is one of the most important things for, um, this is like one of the most important things for game developers is because labor costs are high and you really don't want to skimp on them because these are the people who you're working with and it would be sort of nice if they could have a living wage. Something that lets you do your work faster, um, one allows you to release the game faster, it allows you to produce more games, and it, uh, it, um, like, you... Basically, you are using those tools more, sorry, you're using the existing things that you have more effectively. Um, and once you apply competition to that, the price goes down. Now, again, games are, are pricing too low anyway, but the different price, like the biggest things is that you can't disentangle the quality from the game. And the simplest case that I could give is if you look at the AAA space, just look at what the cost of the base game is, which has basically been unchanged. There's actually on the blog, if you go to the one about the very the first um, loot box article I wrote, I actually do the measure of the cost of games over time. And the fact that we've had positive inflation since like, I think Oblivion was like one of the first ones that hit that $60 level. The fact that AAA games really have not moved beyond that, but the fact that we've had inflation since then, means that in real terms, the cost of games has gone down. Like even if you just isolate for that single price point, in real terms, the price has gone down. Um, and I believe at that point, I've caught up with chat. So for those of you who could not read chat on YouTube, I'm very sorry. You've probably skipped over at this point. Um, but uh, there we go. The Davy Reedon. Uh, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll get the exact name of it. I know I lost a lot of viewers over that, but that's that's just how this stuff works. Uh, Reedon. It is called Absolutely a True Crime Story. This thing is so ridiculous. I feel bad for sharing it, but I, it made me laugh, so. Beginner's Guide is a fantastic game. Um, all right, I got my awareness of appetite. The well in the wood is never dry, but it is never clear. One night, it might heave with crawling roots. On another, it might pul uh, pulse with bright moss. On nights when the full mo uh, of the full moon, its waters are choked with the fat dappled bodies of moths. Last night, I saw it brimming with dark and viscous blood. Gelatinous shreds drifted on its surface, clots of grail matter. Okay, I was going to do something with my dreams. I thought I was going to, at least. 
Uh, let me free all this stuff. Out. Okay, so we've got Debellus Mirorum. Might as well go back to Oriflames. Yeah. Um, this is the drawback of like getting really into the. the way. I I love doing it. Like you, you guys are really wonderful to. Uh, uh, to have exchanges with in that that regard, but I I definitely like blow it in terms of in terms of sort of keeping on on top of things whenever uh, whenever I <laughs> I hit that that point. There always seems to be one <laughs> one point. I put it off this time around, but I I still wound up. Uh, let's chat with. Count Jennings, the good Count's fraternity is uh, in Europe is seeking particular research. I suppose I should have turned in with the Deem as well so I could get that counter going down, but I'm committed to the choice now, and unless I see something fancy with the... Yeah, I don't have like anything to heal or that, so I think I'm just going a bit loopy, so... We'll go back to the wood. We will use our passion for the privilege, and I, I will check out the new uh, the new silly RPG Maker game. Yeah, so I get that a lot, Ego Akaran. The catch is, is that that ooh stum a can of nitrate film labeled stum silent or perhaps mute. The director's name is Jernik Krosa, and it is shakily appended. So the main reason why I don't edit things for YouTube is it's another time trade-off. So the thing is, is that I am always grateful for... I also didn't explain who Count Jannings is. So Count Gottlob Jannings represents a continental confraternity of physicians and duelists. He has offered you a commission. Um, now we will talk with Dr. Redeem and, and turn it in. So I'm actually quite grateful for the attention on YouTube, and uh, Cultus Simulator does generally get more than um, the other stuff that I do. But the big catch is, is that it is, for me at least, even though I do know a thing or two about editing, some days are better than others, some days the sky feels uh, is nothing like a filthy sheet. Sometimes the river, river runs clear. Um, so one of the drawbacks is that uh, it takes quite a bit of time to do a proper edit. Um, whereas if I just go live and I put it out there, um, the cost to me in time is like, it's a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of time spent generating the content and content released. Whereas if I edit, there's the time I spend recording then there's the time I spend reviewing it, there's the time I spend cutting, and there's more time spent to produce less content. Now, the thing is, is that not every minute of my content is the same. I am very well aware of Nobody is more aware of it than I am. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is, is that YouTube started and has largely been about keeping a re the only reason I actually started using YouTube was because it um, Twitch said that they were no longer going to be permanently archiving videos and I wanted to make sure that for whatever reason if something interesting happened on a stream that I didn't realize let's say within the week or two I wanted some means of, of preserving the record uh, and so that's why I put things on YouTube. Now, I've become conscious of the fact that people watch on YouTube. And actually, I mean, on the specs, some people do watch the whole way through and they comment on that. So it's not just that they're... I mean, I think a lot of people putting... Uh, put it, I think a lot of people like putting this on in the background. I don't think people really watch this to learn on YouTube to learn how to play uh, Cultist Simulator. But um, the... Uh, the, the big thing is that I prefer, so for the stuff that I would cut down, I would prefer to just make the clean break and say, this is going to be stuff that I create specifically for YouTube and things that are intended to be streamed. For instance, the vodcasts that I do for Elder Scrolls, those aren't edited because those are still things that basically I use to fill in my Tuesdays. And so, 
when I have something specific in mind for YouTube, uh, I'll do that and I will definitely edit those. But for the purposes of Twitch, because it's a live experience, I, you know, I can't edit them. And so when I put them up on YouTube, they are, they're the full thing because in the end they're more an archive rather than, um, than a full broadcast. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that I, I don't have the time for it, but even if I did, I think it would be, I would personally prefer to add another day to my streaming schedule than I would to spend the time cutting things down for YouTube. If I were to get a really strong comment, which says, I prefer seeing your things on YouTube, and it would, you know, if, if you were to actually put the time on the YouTube channel, I would watch more than on the Twitch channel. If I were to get that, like in the numbers that show that clearly I have misunderstood how people interact with my channel, then obviously that's some thinking I need to do. Then I need to sit down and say, well, maybe I'm actually more cut out to be a YouTube streamer. But I, I will admit, like I do, I, I do like the the back and forth of a live a live interaction. I I tend to find that YouTube comments, while people have been very nice in them, um, it's very easy to interpret a lot of YouTube comments in a very hostile light, um, and that reflects some of the first comments that I got on YouTube more than anything. And so I. I realize it's an imperfect system, but it's an imperfect system that exists within the constraints that I have. Um, it exists within the, con uh, the, the constraints of my, um, my, uh, my available time. And casual nothing, I did see your comment on Debellis Mirorum. That's cool, because I don't... I, I, I know Debellis, um, just because, you know, I, it, it comes up a lot in famous, uh, famous Latin titles. But... Um, I don't know. I didn't know what Mirorum was, so thank you for that. Uh, let me just quickly finish the fulfill uh, commission for Dr. Adim, and then I've got a couple things, including somebody who gave me a tag and a wave, so I want to say hi there. So I received uh, the currency of the secret world, and my patron has let tantalizing information slip. So um, Ragnus is referring to Ego, so if there was something important for me there, uh, do let me know. Bethesda added new gameplay feature for Arena. Wait, no new gameplay features from Bethesda, please. How are you doing? UNSM0. Um, ba -ba. I discovered the channel via YouTube via Cult of Simulator and actually watched it. Yeah, this is the funny thing is that there are a lot of people who say, it's like, yeah, I watched the whole thing and I like your stuff and I really wish you'd stop complaining about your digressions because they are the reason I come here. <laughs> but um, I'm just a big old nervous ball of self-loathing who wishes he could do things better than he does. So... <laughs> Um, one thing you could say is you have the right voice for nicely edited content on YouTube. Yes, Sadi, that's, this is the big thing is I sort of know that I, like, I have a few things in the back of my head I shouldn't have, no wait, uh, it's the book that I'm going to be doing. Okay. I'm feeling a lot more hopeful that I'm going to be able to combine this winter, so good news there. I do actually have some specific ideas. Oops, uh, tonight my benefactor is full of energy and I should be too. Let's toss the energy in and hope for the best. Um, I actually think, uh, I, I have some specific ideas. Oof. We have got a string of bad luck with this. So my benefactor is restless for whatever reason, despite my best efforts, my benefactor does not seem interested in me tonight. They do make an effort to bid me a courteous goodbye, but their customary gift seems like an afterthought. I wonder if there's a timer in here. The fact that I am always rushing after her and not letting her, not letting her get a little bit of anticipation building up. I wonder if that's what's causing me to be boring. So I'll tease her a bit. The auctioneer makes a note of my name and signals one of the attendants. I have my prize. I hope it's worth it. Stum is always worth it. I thought Stum was such an interesting idea, and it started off as an Oreo. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I have actually specifically got um, some YouTube ideas in mind. I don't know. Oh, it was Vitality that, that burned up. Um, I do actually have some specific ideas in mind, but it is a little, it's just one of these things where I've got, 
a lot of there's a lot of things that I have in mind, and it's a question of how I'm able to spend that time. And one of the things is that the week, the three times a week broadcast is something that I know if I do a live thing, people are going to have an expectation that it will be happening at the time that I say. So I'm okay being a little late for cast like I was tonight, but I'm not okay with just dropping it. And so if you think about it, like I have anywhere between nine to 12 hours of my week blown out just by doing live broadcasts. And so now I need to decide, you know, between my economics projects, my, um, some of the programming stuff that I'm doing, I still like to read. Um, there's probably three big things that I'm prepping for stream, like live broadcasts, which like, these are big projects that I have underway. Um, it's just one of these cases where, you know, something has to give. And at the moment, I kind of feel like I, I have some clear ideas about what I'm going to do with YouTube, but I sort of feel like it would be better if I can get a little bit of a back catalog in terms of stuff I've prepped for YouTube so that it will allow me to be able to, um, it'll be, it'll, it'll give me some breathing room that I don't feel like I need to dedicate a day to get some, some edited YouTube stuff in. Um, but it'll happen at some point, so. Uh, UNSM0, I would actually like to voice act, but I don't do it, um, I don't do it professionally. Um, I do it more on an ad hoc basis on, uh, on, um, uh, you know, just for games. Actually, probably if you, I appreciate this stuff is hard to find when you're looking on the YouTube channel and that, but if you ever do get a chance to find my Shadowrun Hong Kong playthroughs, uh, I wound up doing a lot more voice acting than I anticipated on that. So if you guys do like it when I do voices, that's probably the best example of it. But thank you very much, you uh, and SMO. It's, um, I know this sounds funny. I was, so one, I had a speech impediment as a kid. Two, I was very uncomfortable with the sound of my voice for a long time, and I still haven't gotten over it, but I can now watch my VODs without muting them. And one of the reasons I've been able to do that is the constant praise that's been coming in. So really, just keep that coming. It really encourages me. No, but it's, it's funny, like, I have not thought of myself in that way. And it is very nice to hear people say that because it, I, I am very stubborn in my unhelpful beliefs about myself. Um, so it's, I hear it. Um, in fact, uh, the producer of Culta Simulator had a very lovely description, a voice like maple syrup being poured through a Canadian flag. <laughs> um, I really cannot, pa I, I really cannot, um, you know, I, there's nothing I can do to, to top that description. Um, all I can do is try to live up to it. Um, but like I said, th those unhelpful beliefs are ones that are difficult to shake. So it's something I, it's something I really, I really appreciate. And when people do my, so I, I will actually briefly say like, the voice acting thing was not something I volunteered because I know a lot of streamers who have this view of like, um, oh yeah, I'm going to become a voice actor. And it's just sort of like, because I'm a broadcaster, that's something I'm entitled to. You know, I'm, I'm entitled to a job in voice acting because I'm me. And I really did not want to be one of those people. But I also really like doing this. Um, I probably would be better at narrating audiobooks than voice acting, but I have now actually put in some auditions. I never got like a callback for any of them, so I have a feeling there's a lot that I need to learn to be able to, to work on that sort of stuff. But um, every time somebody mentions it, it is actually something that makes me feel... Um, It makes me feel better. It actually gives me the encouragement to go and try again. So, I don't know if you guys have heard of the game Unavowed. I didn't actually put an audition in. They gave an open audition, and I was thinking of doing it, and I, I ultimately sort of chickened out because I... I was just sort of like, well... You know, it's not me that they would look for, right? This sort of belief. 
Um, and I, I don't really think I would have gotten anything, but it would have been nice if I tried, because then I could have at least told you, it's like, hey, did you know that I auditioned for Unavowed? <laughs> um, and then I would have used that to go into the next audition. So by the way, if you guys, uh, that was actually somebody from outside uh, let me know about that audition. So if you guys ever do know of something that's coming up, um, some of you do actually do this for money, so please don't let me step on uh, on your own opportunities. But if you know of something, uh, this is actually something I'm interested in pursuing. Um, and it is my job to find opportunities. But if you know of some, uh, it is something I would be grateful to, um, you know, to, to be able to get a little more, uh, a little more experience with. Okay, let's see what I can get. Ooh. Demonstrate my abilities to Mr. Agdistus. I am ready for one of the more exacting dances that occur deeper in the club, in the room behind the red bay's door. Mr. Agdistus will adjudge my suitability. So let's commit health. Ooh. I'm missing the right influence, but it seems like I don't need to use it, so let's try that. How did my voice survive the- I'm still doing the arena project, Ego Karen. For those of you who don't know what Ego is talking about, this isn't exactly the dark elf voice from Morrowind. It is, however, an interpretation of the character that, uh, that I'm playing in arena. And if you think it sounds like a difficulty to do this in, say, four hours straight, you are correct. That was probably not dark and smooth and soft and soothing, uh, Eyes of Sin, so. <laughs> you left a comment in YouTube about your voice. I think you did, Ragnus Domi. Um, but I am... You weren't the one who talked about watching the full video in that comment. That, that must be another comment, or am I mixing them up? I feel like that was a comment where you said you'd like, I can't believe I watched the full thing, too. Talking like that for hours would kill you? <laughs> I mean, we, we just finished episode 10 of that ego, so... Okay, so my the filing cabinet isn't totally full yet. Okay, so yes, I do remember that comment, and it made me feel very good. Thank you for that. All right, I don't think I need a copy of Gildersleeve, so we'll leave it. Uh, this time the research has failed, but I've learned the lessons of experience. Well, that's not surprising that we, we didn't go through. So the question here is, um, do I try? No, we're going to pay up for Stum. Unlock books and other tra treasures, so we need to pay for the projector. The film rattles through the projector, glows silently on the wall. It is a story of a foolish student of the forbidden sciences who recruits a dancer to entice the dead back into the world through a flaw in its skin. It's a fiction, but here on the title card is laid out the operation of the declining sun. You thought people changed their voice in computers to sound like that? I mean, they normally do. Um, <clears throat> I used to be able to do this a little bit better, but I think... Um, the Morrowind voice is something like, you know, let me see if I can find the, the line, um, Morrowind dialogue opening. Come on, just any, any dialogue that's coming up. I don't know, it's something like, um, you know, you were tossing and turning and, oh god, no, that's not right. Anyways, it's a raspier voice than what I normally do. Uh, I can't quite, I think I need to listen to a recording a little bit, but I didn't want to just ape the voice acting in Morrowind, I wanted to try and do a unique take on it. And people at least seem to roughly recognize that it is somewhat dark elfish. Um, so, um, 
The other one was, I mean, it's a similar voice to what I just did before, but in um, Reigns, I remember when the devil showed up, um, that's when I read the, uh, the dialogue, and it was something like, Little pet. And, you know, I was very pleased by the reactions that, uh, that people gave, gave for that. Mr. Agdistus claps his long and beautiful hands together. He smiles fondly. He will take a very little of my blood, just in case, and then we'll be ready. All right, what did I just get myself into? A superior contract at the Agdistus Club. I perform the more exacting dances at the Agdistus Club. I have a feeling this is gonna... Oof. Well, that's encouraging, actually. So let's see if I can get myself another um, another heart influence. You know what? I need to be getting myself some more vitality. I think I know how I'm going to handle this. So, okay, 86 seconds, 99 seconds. Let's go back to the gaiety just because we can. Hopefully that'll give me a little vitality to work with. You love the Morrowind intro sound. Gives you the feeling of it. You mean like the intro music? Because you are going to be very happy in like three or four months. You want to be a sanguine cultist, a blood drinker? I know, okay, actually we can do a quick poll in here. I think I kind of know where everybody's sitting on this, but I'm lightly curious about people's preferred cults in chat at the moment. I'm gonna go for the occult scrap again, mostly. Oh no, actually, sorry. I thought, I, I said I was gonna try and get some influence. So let's see what the Temple of the Wheel gives me. I think this turns into something nasty too. Last night I came in the wood uh, to the high jagged rock called the Temple of the Wheel. Its flank, patched with black lichen and eye signs, opened like a mouth beneath my hands, and I walked in the whispering space within. The gods who were stone, the first of the hours, are almost all gone now, but here their voices remain. Wheel, flint, tide, and others without names. All right, casual nothing is, is my new favorite because uh, the one true the one true faith. Eyes of Sin has always stood by Grail as your preferred cult, but that's fine because I, I still like you as a person, even if you believe in heresies. Uh, Ragnus Domi also really likes Grail. Okay, well, you and Sin are in good company, so that's 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 fine. I, I have nothing but the deepest respect for, you know, your, your people of the book. Ooh, Nock is a good one, yes. Um... I think Nock also has this like default status of like a an, a highly appealing cult because um, Neville's in it, and if you don't like Neville, you have nothing. <laughs> okay, for this, the true and complete accounting of the Asclepian mysteries in the roots of the house. All right, so. You'll notice that I hesitated a little bit to, to watch Stoom. That's because I know what's coming up. So I wanted to make sure that this dread was gone, or sorry, the despair was gone. Now I need to be careful about fascination, but I don't think there's a lot I can do about that. I can never remember what this subtle flaw turns into, but I'm sure I'll find out in a minute. The lantern ending is pretty cool. Lantern ending was the first ending I got, but I have a feeling that's probably the first ending that most people get. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I like, I mean, I don't think most people. I'm willing to guess that I think most people who would make a guess in terms of what I would be would probably say Lantern. Um, but I don't know. Just because it's the just because it's the first one doesn't mean that it can't be the best. You know, ego. I okay. I might still do this. One of the YouTube only videos I had in mind was a joke video about a hidden ending to Cultist Simulator, like a secret ending that people had never noticed before. And it would be 
The Super Neville ending, where you try to sell him at the auction house, and he becomes far more powerful than you could ever imagine. It gives you one of every lore until the... Like, and I had this all worked out in terms of how I would make it look the way that it did. And then the table would kind of go up in flames, like the ending that comes up. And it would reveal the Neville Ascendant ending. And I actually wrote out the Neville Ascendant ending for the game. Um, and the reason I didn't do it was because around the time I started working out the motions of, like, trying to make it look like a credible... But like, oh my god, I didn't know this was in the game thing. Was somebody left this like really upset message in the YouTube comments. There was the video called The Sims But Unspeakable Evil. And they were like, this isn't The Sims. You're misleading people by calling it The Sims in the title. And I'm like, you know what? I really don't want to deal with like 110 people saying, OMG, clickbait title. <laughs> and I'm like... And now I realize that would have actually been something that would be really fun for, like, the majority of people who are actually going to stick around and see my stuff. So I actually feel a little bit bad that I backed down from that idea, because I think that would have been fun. And there's nothing saying I can't do it, it's just I, I have a little less time to prepare stuff like that. But, yeah, I, I actually did have... I did have that Neville running his own cult thing in mind, so... Yeah, well, this is just it, like, be, I, but, so, like, this, this is maybe a little, I don't know if you guys find this interesting, but, like, this is sort of the psychology of what went on when I suddenly realized, like, Cultist Simulator became a thing, and all of a sudden, like, out of nowhere, these people started watching the videos. Like, before then, uh, Tristan dislikes distractions, Tristan gets things done. Before that, I only ever knew YouTube as that place where occasionally people who want... I'm thinking of a couple of YouTubers in particular who I won't mention, but are sort of normally associated with being sort of dickish. Um, people who are like following them, going on things like my, you know, my, my um, Battlefield 1 of the Lawrence of Arabia episode, and just like writing things like, you need to study the Lawrence of Arabia more because I, you know, I kind of blew it in terms of the the explanation of his background. I didn't have it in the top of my head because, like, you know, you can't remember everything. Um, and I sort of suddenly realized that people were, like, learning about the game or potentially buying the game off of the, the videos, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. Um, I was happy it was happening. Like, I, you know, please don't take this as, like, oh, poor me, you know. I suddenly became internet famous, because I didn't. I mean, most of my videos are, you know, single-digit views, and the Cult of Simulator ones now sometimes get about 100, 100 views. That's nothing on YouTube. But it's a lot for me, and if you're one of those people contributing to that number, thank you. Um, but yeah, so I, I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. And so, you know, it wasn't just the fact that I was worried about that people would say something mean on there, but I wasn't, I was generally unsure what people were expecting from the videos. So I sort of felt that if for whatever reason I had, even though these are recordings of streams, like I had unintentionally stumbled into being, this is going to sound a little puffed up, but I don't have a better way of saying it, like an authority, quote unquote, on Cult Simulator. Um, like, I didn't want to then suddenly release a, a video titled The Secret Ending to Cultist Simulator, even though I think it's, like, clearly a joke. There are still people who think The Onion is real. Um, so I lost my nerve a little bit on that decision. So it wasn't, it wasn't just purely like, oh, I was bullied, now I'm not gonna do anything for you people. Like, part of it was also just sort of, like, I, I had to discover what it means to have people who watch my cult of simulator stuff and i you know couldn't quite i needed to kind of get an idea in terms of what what i could do to make that uh, better <laughs> um, but why would you sell neville i don't care i'd sell neville so that i could <laughs> 
I could get the so I, I could I could make a funny video eyes of sin <laughs> um, or if you never do it could you at least read the stuff yeah I would definitely do that ego Akaran but I think because people kind of want to see what the video look I mean you guys already know what the punchline is now right but if I hold back the actual text I figure that'll give you a reason to watch that video. Don't hold your breath for it, but I will. I'll. I'll. I'll do what I can. Um, what does System Chalk thinks uh, we should do to the people that we? I mean, guys, I, what are you? What are you getting mad at me for? Alexis made it so that the game, like you, he gets eaten by a snake in this one. <laughs> I think being sold at auction is a far, far lighter fate than than being uh, than, than being eaten by a snake. Come on, the real person you should be mad at is the game developer. Everyone knows that you should always voice your complaints as loudly and as rudely as possible to the game developer. Support at whatever. No. <laughs> Please send your appreciation and admiration to support at weatherfactory.biz. Uh, the right is depicted in chilling detail. Here is the flaw in the world, an influence shimmering in luminous paint. Here is the dancer establishing an irresistible rhythm. Here the scholar recites the operation, and now the misty dead whirls through the flaw to consume him. The film closes on the dancer's watchful eyes. Had she intended it all from the start? <laughs> it's okay, Neville. I'll protect you from consumerism, you sweet, lovely darling. Neville group hug. Just realize your stream says you're playing the Elder Scrolls. I does it? That's really bad if it does. Ah, oh, crap. Okay, that should be fixed now. I should be able to fix that on the VOD, but... I should be able to fix that on the... I should be able to fix that on the... <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Streamception. Weird. So that's the second time. I had such a, f I had such a funny, uh, not a funny, I had such a good title. Oh, does it actually say? I mean, it's pretty much the end of the cast and it's finally, nope, it says Crystal Tower for me now. Something screwy with this, uh, with this update. So the title should be The Dance of the Seven Fails and, oh, Category Elder Scrolls Arena. What about... Game? Hooray! Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I appreciate it. By the way, thank you for letting me know that I messed that up. That is not something... I don't want, like... I know I do Elder Scrolls Arena stuff, but... I don't want people coming in wanting one thing and then finding another one, so... Alright, so we got Stoom. I need to deal with the Dread. I should be able... Actually, you know what? I will advance in the Mansus right now. So there is a house in the wood and a door where the dead sometimes go. I have read the paths the dead take. And in the meantime, let's go study... Apollo and Marsyas, because everybody loves the heart. In the original myth, Marsyas lost a musical contest and was flayed by Apollo, who later regretted it. In this version, Marsyas' skin has a further history. 
Uh, the libretto of a lost opera concerning the contest between Apollo and Marsyas and his tragic outcome. The librettist is identified only by their initials R, K, N, J, L. You say you hate how dread works in the game, uh, Sign. What, what do you, um, what isn't working for you in that, out of curiosity? All right, and we've got the true and complete accounting of the Asclepian mysteries and the roots of the house. I was going to do uh, another exploration. Th oh yeah, I was going to start using my occult scraps. Um, but I want, to, I want to buy things. I like buying things. Opportunity at the Gaiety Theater. Tonight is since opportunity. Tonight I could attract attention if I cease to hold back and commit myself more fully. I think I'll use passion. I'm not going to be using as much passion to access the Mansus. And this is something, something, deep mystery, something. So I think we've exhausted the books at Aura Flams. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the same boat as as uh, Ragnus Domi. Like I'm not, I'm not asking. Is like, how dare you? You know, <laughs> I must defend the honor of my lady, Cult Simulator. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, in, I'm interested in how people interact with the game because it, it is again worth remembering that I. Like, I remember when this game told you nothing, and that I had to brute force all of the combinations to try and make some progress, and even then I still didn't make very much progress in the game. Um, so it's interesting to me to see how people sort of react to these, um, to these things that I kind of take for granted. My benefactor would be delighted if I'd offer a private performance for a small and refined audience. They'll invite me to dinner afterwards and, of course, offer suitable gifts in return for my time. I did indeed finish off Moreland's. Uh, you noticed that there was 18 viewers in the Elder Scrolls arena, and you're like, huh, that's more than usual. And then you went to look at who was streaming, and you saw my stream categorized under it. I, yeah, thank you for that, uh, Captain Shield. I, I, I can definitely fix the VOD. Uh, I actually like the fact that Twitch added that um, added that feature, but I do genuinely feel bad for the people who uh, who came in expecting the Elder Scrolls. That's really nice of you guys. Uh, you know, the the viewer numbers were certainly healthy um, by my standards tonight, which means that you guys came in either because you've come to expect Cult of Simulator Wednesdays or you otherwise are following my stuff. So, um, it, that is not something I take for granted. Thank you. Tristan dislikes distractions. Tristan likes results. All right, we'll get Leo into the cult right away. You have to juggle between dread and fascination. You cannot manage it in an active and assured way. I think they've changed. So I think fascination works a little bit differently now. Um, but there, I have a few different ways of dealing with dread now. Dread is actually the, one of the first obstacles that I felt that I overcame in a relatively confident way. But I also think that's probably an individual play. Like, it's a little bit like saying, like, when I play a particular strategy game, I'm like, you know, this faction is just way too overpowered, and this other one is totally ineffective. The game is actually probably perfectly balanced, and I just have my preferences, and I'm trying to extend my preferences to a general, um, you know, to, to, to a more general case, which is inappropriate for the game. Um, so it may be that just because I find uh, dread somewhat straightforward to deal with, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's true for everyone. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's fleeting memories or fleeting remembrance that helps with um, fascination now. I don't recall. Uh, for example, XCOM has RNG in it, but there are grenades or explosives as guaranteed solution. Well, not if you're up against like a muton or something like that, but I, I kind of see where you're going with this. Um, I mean, I've never felt that I've died to random chance in the game. I do feel that I've gotten unlucky in a draw and I put myself in a situation where I wasn't able to recover, but I felt that that was more my 
lack of planning than it was, you know, being dicked by by some draw or something like that. So somebody who said hi. Last Geek Plays. Hello. Sorry. I'm doing a bad job of catching up with chat because I, I tried to burn through a lot of chat and I wanted to get some advancement in terms of gameplay and I'm actually at the, the end of my time uh, but I want to try and make a little more progress in the game. So you guys are actually getting me for longer than I was planning and I might pay I might pay for it. Um, uh, I might pay for it in terms of uh, in terms of work tomorrow, but you guys are worth it. Do you think it's unpredictable to point that it's for? Oh, that was probably for uh, Siam. You tricked him into playing video games. <laughs> yeah. I don't define myself as a gamer, last keeps plays. Um, these are the bounds about the house, with their mists and their traces. This is the rock called the Temple of the Wheel, high as a church spire, patched with black lichen and daubed with eye signs. I round it, and there ahead of me, excuse me, is the white door, a glow like the moon in winter. Excuse me, the moon in winter. The exception, how are you doing? In my dreams, I've passed the white door, which has been called the bone door and the gate of ivory. My voice remains outside the house each time I enter, but that's my selling point. In my dreams, I know the path to the white door though the ba uh, through the bounds, but that path is thronged with the dead who pass that way. I will need health to resist their chill. So I don't mean to... So for those of you who want to figure this stuff out on your own, now might be a good time to mute the stream for a couple of minutes. Um, but I would say a few of the ways that I handle dread. So the thing to keep in mind about, uh, dread. So one of the potential sources of dread is, uh, restlessness. So finding ways to deal with restlessness will help. Another way is to find a regular source of contentment to deal with dread. And again, there are somewhat reliable ways of obtaining contentment. One final thing, and one really important message from Culta Simulator is that things that seem like uh, things that will harm you can potentially be used to your benefit. It's actually why I think Edge sometimes is not a bad starter cult for people, because if you think about it, you could actually use Dread to upgrade a cultist. Um, and if you use, if you have an Edge cult, it's a little bit easier to use it in in that way. Restlessness is generally easier to upgrade um, cults because it has so many of the different aspects. So there's many roads to enlightenment. There are, I know for a fact that I deal with dread and fascination different ways than other people I know who play the game. Um, so to me, I've felt every, you know, every time I'm just ready to throw up my hands and say, this is a little broken in Cult of Simulator, I always find a way around it. And then I'm like, ah, I was unfamiliar rather than the game not being there. But again, that's, I like, I am very comfortable with this game and I've been playing it for a long time. And so I'm not entirely sure it's fair for me, someone very familiar with the game, to turn around and say, oh, well, if you have 133 hours in Cultist Simulator, Dread is the easiest thing to deal with. Maybe you don't need to spend over 100 hours in the game to learn how to deal with it. So that's, um, you know, I, 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 I think there's probably some middle ground that we can find and, and my own perspective is just drawn from... You do need to revisit the game, though, uh, before the dancer came out. You played about 10 hours and left in frustration. That's fair. I mean, it's the other thing, Siam, is it's not for everyone. Um, I think if you were able to put 10 hours into it, um, there's probably something that was working. Actually, this was a so this is one thing I really like about the developers um, of this game. I would probably feel quite bad at the negative reviews. I felt a lot of the negative reviews were unfair, but that's because I'm a very big fan of Culta Simulator. I think that's um, that's kind of a given. I'm going to try Explore one more time just to make sure that the, the book wasn't a fluke, but I'm pretty sure we're done with Oriflams for now, so the rest of this is going to be digesting the, the books that I do have. Um, I think it was Lottie who said this. Um, but I think one of the ways, maybe if make peace is the wrong word, wrong term, but 
think one of the ways that they made sense of the, yep, something, something, deep mystery, something. I think one of the ways that they made sense of the, um, the negative feedback was that it was people saying that they wanted to like the game and they were so close to liking the game. And there was just that one thing that was like a deal breaker. And so that frustration was expressed in the form of the negative review. Um, and I mean, so I'll, I'll give you an idea. Like this is this is why I am better and should should limit myself to playing games and not making games. Because if you want to make games, then your livelihood depends on keeping players happy. <laughs> Or at the very least, keeping them non-antagonistic. Uh, and so they were able to step back, look at the game, and understand what that reaction was. That, that reaction never said, here are the specific reasons I would like to articulate. Um, and so what, you know, what Siam's describing here very well could be the sort of thing where it's like, you know, I really did try. I spent five hours in this game and I just feel like Dread is this random event that's just coming in and crushing me at this time that I, you know, I feel like I should be making some progress. Um, and, you know, I, I got to play the game in sort of sterner times, so it's not a direct experience that I can relate to as much, but that does not mean that that's not a true thing that people feel and should not be, you know, looked at seriously. Um, but again, like, this is just it. Like, if, if I wanted, like, I could write a snide blog and, like, you know, you're all too stupid to understand Cult of Simulator, and I'm sure I would feel good about it, but, you know, if I was responsible for selling the game, that would be the worst possible decision that I could make. Again, it's one of the reasons why I like speaking very highly of the developers behind this game, because they are very accessible people and they are conscious about how people are reacting to their game. And they are... I like the fact that they are so open in terms of how, how they discuss about it, even when things go wrong. Like they, you know, they confront it pretty directly, which is, I think, a very admirable trait. And it's one of the things that has made this game so enjoyable to follow, so... Um, so, Regnus Domi, I, I see your last question here, but um, thank you for saying that, Regnus Domi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the, so Siam, if, yeah, please, please don't take any of that as, um, as judgmental, because um, I have a lot of sympathy for your, for your position, and I think, you know, I, I am from a... I'm from a perspective that is not representative of what a normal consumer will get, but I do hope you I do hope you pick up the game and that you get to enjoy it again. I think the dancer added a lot that makes it interesting. So, um, so anyways, uh, Rangus Tommy says that makes sense. Dealing with dread and fascination, your first hours was impossible. Yeah, I mean, you guys get to see. I had a couple of very disappointing fascination endings, um, but that's how the game works. You learned how to do it, and you're not a major strategist, so you hope you feel more satisfied in the uh, future. You definitely don't have more than 100 hours. Yeah, I'm. please don't spend more than 100 hours in this game unless you really love it. Uh, and pretty random, but has anybody told you that they listen to your streams to sleep? Lots of times, actually, and I think that is wonderful um, because I frankly would not watch me. <laughs> and I like that people like my stuff enough to do that. Wasn't rhetorical. Was le legit question. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I um, I, it surprises me a little bit because I think sometimes I do suddenly get loud and um, and silly, but I like hearing that stuff. Um, because again, like this is the this is the funny thing. Like I, uh, so so there's two. There are are actually two things that um. I'm trying to come up with the best way to say this. So there are two things that might not be immediately apparent from the way that I conduct myself on this channel right now, or, or in general. Uh, and those are, I have 
only partially moved away from the person who's uncomfortable hearing the sound of his own voice. Um, I feel reasonably comfortable public speaking, but to be confronted with a recorded artifact of my own voice is something that I've only recently sort of been able to sort of kind of overcome. Um, so it's one of these things where, like, I'm, I, you know, it's not this, like, rhetoric of Twitch, oh, you're all my family, you know, I love you so much, you're the best audience, everybody, you know, every, every streamer believes this, and they, hopefully they sincerely believe it, because honestly, you guys have lots of options, and you should not be wasting your time on people who take you for granted. Um... But beyond just, you know, the, the small ego boost that comes from a, you know, a stream of compliments coming in, uh, it, it does actually mean a lot because it's just one of these things where I'm, I'm still not that far away from the person who, uh, you know, doesn't think in the terms that people describe him. Describe him. Uh, the other one that's maybe a little less apparent, uh, maybe more so if you've seen the Steam streams. I'm actually a lot more comfortable speaking to larger audiences, and that's online or uh, or in person. Um, so there have only been a couple of times, really Stellaris and... Um, it's really just been Stellaris and... Um, Dark Souls, which are ones that have naturally generated over a hundred viewers, and then Cultist Simulator on um, on Steam. Uh, I actually find it much more comfortable to do a presentation, and I, I give a different style of cast normally. Although Cultist Simulator, I do tend to be a little monologue-y. Um, but uh, I'm actually much more comfortable speaking to large groups than small, intimate ones like this. But, you know, that's a nice problem to have. <laughs> I'm sure every streamer would love it if it's like, you know, I really do my best work when a couple of hundred people are inside. Like, I'm, I'm not a streamer of that scale, and I don't think my stuff appeals enough to be as, as broad of a... Uh, I, I, I think I have some work to do before I could reasonably expect for myself to have audiences like that. Um, so while I may be more comfortable with it, it's not something I necessarily expect to have happen. Although, with that in mind, Weather Factory has been extremely generous in terms of the attention that they've given me. I've definitely reached a lot of people who I wouldn't have otherwise, specifically because they've mentioned me in things like the newsletter or they've given me the opportunity to be on Steam. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and then, you know, somebody like W. Shand used to host me every once in a while, and that usually bring in quite a few people and such. Um, so it is a chance for me to sort of realize that I still have it in me. Um, I definitely don't speak to audiences of over 100 on a regular basis, um, but it is, it is actually the speaking environment I'm most comfortable in. Um, I can handle a smaller room. Um, I have on occasion be told, it's like, you know, you're actually quite smooth up there. <laughs> um, but that's, I don't feel like that's the sort of thing I can say about myself. I usually just need to promise you that somebody really actually said that once in my life. Um, but uh, but yeah, personally, I'm actually much more comfortable speaking to, to larger audiences than smaller ones. <laughs> I, I'd not watch me, sort of, it's just because we have different tastes, Ragnus Domi. Um, yeah, well, it's a living game, Siam, so I think, uh, I, I definitely think there'll be more more content for you. There might even be another DLC, depending when you have your uh, computer again. So I went back to the uh, VOD and about the Moreland thing. Uh, one cool thing would be unlocking a path to immortality for either for you or disciples, else could be an avenue for new believers or renewable books that you can order, like purple ones. Interesting. You're all just here for the boobs? Sorry to disappoint you, Ego. <laughs> um, I'm actually very skinny in in uh, person, so I, I I think I could I would not even be able if I tried my hardest I would possibly not be able to even achieve cleavage. But for a mere forty nine ninety nine, no, actually not a let's say I've been, I'm sure somebody would take that as as a genuine solicitation, and I would get some kind of a strike on Twitch. But um, 
The ceremony is resonant with the sun, thunder, and church. I know it well. I wrote it myself. Leo is an earnest, earnest sort, but he's prepared to do what he must. Okay, so we've got the followers I can now. We're starting to fill out the ranks. I think we're missing... Uh, well, we're definitely not missing secret history, so let's just adjust this around. Um, we're missing edge is the last one. Uh, we should be able to... Debellus Mirorum is obviously in Latin, but the victory of crowns is not. So let's get that. Erratic accounts by one Arun of the hunting and consumption of supposed immortals by shadowy cults of assassin, assassins. Published in the late 19th century. Why I'm trying to talk to the victory of crowns, I have no idea. Let's get a commission, and I'm probably going to get some bed after... Uh, after I take a visit through the white door. If you're ever willing to stream Sentinels of the Mut uh, Multiverse, by the way, there's a small audience for it, and it's active uh, enough multiplayer community plus a uh, Discord community so you can collaborate. I actually had a very pleasant experience with the Prismata community. Um, Uh-oh, is my benefactor about to propose? They have an air of suppressed ex uh, excitement tonight. Well, there goes my last patron. So... Nicole Fourth Marchioness of Stanford. In a moment of passion, the most honorable Nicole has proposed marriage. If I seize the moment and accept, this will transform my life and close other doors forever. Talk to, talk to the Marchioness before her enthusiasm wanes, or she'll feel spurned. Sorry, milady, but I have a higher calling. Um, so we'll do some work at the gaiety. I need to start watching my health a bit because I'm sick and I'm I'm going to the land of dream. Um, because it's three, so you gotta go. I'll I'll be done uh, fairly soon as well, Ragnus Domi. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, I don't think you're gonna miss out on too much other than going through the white door. But thank you for stopping by, being so pleasant as always. Um, but it's uh, yeah. It's getting a bit late for me as well, and I've already gone over time for what I was expecting. So, but yeah, so, uh, Nefkros, I, I can't make any promises that I'll do Sentinels of the Multiverse, but I actually had, uh, with Prismata, I had a very similar um, kind of experience and kind of community. I found it a very pleasant experience, and so uh, it's one I'm willing to entertain, but of course I have 101 games clamoring for my attention. All of them are wonderful. I actually own Sentinels of the Multiverse, which already puts it ahead of some of the other ones. Um, but I definitely know not to promise in terms of what I'll do in the future, because I am looking at a whiteboard with one, two, nine, June. A conservative estimate would be 22 games. <laughs> uh, pleasure is all mine, Ragnus. I hope you have a wonderful sleep. The skin of Marsyas gives oracles and is later smuggled to Phyrgia, where the priestess of Sybil use it for a drumhead. At the opera's climax, the pounding of the drum drives would-be violators of the priestesses to suicidal madness. The opera ends with a wistful hymn from the youngest priestess on the beauty of mountain pines. All right, so I've got some study options. I've got some talking options. He wants a substantial... Uh, treaties on Lantern, where I don't have any Lantern lore yet. Lore yet. And we'll have a chat with Madame Bichet to get a commission, and I think probably I'm going to start doing some Disciple upgrades relatively soon. Uh... Yeah, no, no worries at all, Ragnus. And obviously, if uh, we don't get a chance to see you, I know the hours don't work for everyone, but I have always been very happy to see your comments on YouTube. Um, so if you ever need something to express, if, actually, you know what, this is a good rule to apply for, for in general. So I like the fact that YouTube is sort of fed into Twitch and the other way around on the chance that you aren't able to catch one or the other. If you do have something that you would like to say to the Twitch chat, uh, that I can pass along, or if you just don't get a chance to, to head in or something like that. Always feel free to say so in the YouTube comments, and I will do my best. Obviously, if you say something nasty, I'm not going to, I'm not going to relay it. Um, but it, chances are, there's not a lot that people want to interact with because I'm not very good at um, at reading out the chat all the time. But if you do have, um, maybe if you participated in the chat and you wanted to get back to someone or you wanted to communicate something, definitely feel free to use the YouTube comments for that because I. 
tend to read them all. I don't think I've missed one yet. I'm slow to reply on a few of them, but that's the worst that could be said. Anyways, have a lovely evening. Uh, the assassins are accounting to a run agents of a power called the Coronel, a soldier of the Secret Masters. The account goes all the way back to Roman times. You'd love to have a pen friend via your Steve. <laughs> Yeah, I need to be I need to be careful in terms of what I'm proposing here because I have a feeling that I'm just going to wind up like it's going to be the first hour and a half is just reading all the messages between YouTube and, and Twitch. Let us hope for a day when I'm so, you know, internet famous that I'm going to be able to, um, you know, that I'm going to have to say, sorry, guys, I can't use the comments anymore. You're too active in your conversations, and it's taken up my very important time as a celebrity broadcaster. But the year 2260 is a very long time away, so I wouldn't worry too much about that happening. Okay, so let's skip over the stuff that requires me to learn a special language, and instead let's start reading... Gallimer ladies work. So, Locksmith's Dream, Light Through the Keyhole, the first volume of Teresa Gallimer's Examination of the Parallels and the Mystic Dreams of Artisans. Why am I trying to talk to a book again? Um, let's chat about the Smith's Secret. And we'll send a pawn off to search the city because I have nothing better to do with my exploration. Uh, don't think you've seen your message about channel discovery on Twitch. Was that a comment in chat here, or was that a, a comment on YouTube? Or was that a Twitch comment? Because I tend not to see, though. The problem is I moderate for a lot of... Um, yeah, sorry, what was this comment um, sent, Seti? And I think I'm going to go to the Orchard of Lights. Ooh, opportunity. Pulsing airs, a rising power, a reassuring energy, a sixth order influence, significant resonances of cor uh, or correspondences. This can be used in some rites to summon minions. All right. This is going to be a great opportunity. Uh, so entering through the white door, the hours have been called unmerciful, but they permit sleepers sometimes to walk the orchard of lights where each fruit glows like a sunset, where the roots of the trees are shaped for peaceful rest, where the mist soothes the heart. I was there last night, and the taste of the fruit lingers, sharp and sweet as the passage of spring to summer. Okay, so pulsing hairs. I'm going to need to be a little careful about this because I'm going to be short on health, but let's throw this health in here to start off with. Um, you feel this is the most difficult kind of channel to find on Twitch. You really need to be looking at the category of game that you're currently playing. Yes, and this is actually a um, this is a challenge uh, from a variety perspective as well. Um, I'll I'll actually articulate a couple. I'll maybe okay. Here's I'll, I I actually want to address what you're you're saying here, Seti. But I think what I should do is I'd like to put a I'd like to put a pin in the game and close it at a, a proper level. So what I might do is I might bank that um, until the last little bit of the stream. I'll do that maybe as a postscript to what we've done tonight. Uh, Cause that's a, that's actually an interesting point that I, I'd like to talk about just cause it's, I don't get a chance to discuss that thing as, as much as I'd like to, so. Um, 
But yeah, you're right, I didn't see that before, Seti, I apologize. Your only beef with this game is that some of the influences are really hard to get naturally, like heart influence only exists low. Yes, I actually tend to notice that I have no reliable way of obtaining um, the influence that I, I want, and I was never sure if that was just because I didn't quite understand what I was trying to go for. Really, I should probably start unlocking some of these locations, but... I wasn't sure if that was a me thing. Oh, damn it. So there's my affliction. It's nice sense an opportunity. We'll put passion into that. I can't really afford the health. Um, I'm not ready to hire a hulking fellow. I don't think I need to off someone yet. Um, but yeah, the, I will admit that influences are something that I've never been able to, to quite figure out um, to, how to get reliably. Felt all their eyes on me. Afterwards, I received a gift from an admirer. A little too personal for me to be comfortable, but I can sell it on the second-hand market. Okay, so contract renewed. Got the money. I was kind of dumb with the dread. I easily could have taken this contentment to cancel it out. Fortunately, we don't have the season to despair coming up, so we should be able to address that. I'm going to get more dread because I don't have the lesson, and I actually need that... Um, I do need that uh, desire uh, relatively soon. That is a shame that that triggered at the time that it did, but I will make the most of it. And in this case, I'm going to give a treatise on moth. It's also worth keeping in mind that I want to be a little careful about my funding because the gaiety doesn't play, pay that well. And my two benefactors have, uh, have sort of stopped um, Stop generating money for me. <laughs> so I'm going to get this health back. So here's an example of kind of how I generally think about the uh, the choices that I have in Culta Simulator. So I've got an affliction here. There's a few different ways that I can handle this. I don't know if I'm going to get this pulsing airs back in time. We'll see. Oh, I'm definitely not going to get it by the end of writing the treaties. I'm going to be corny and I'm probably going to do some, some underhanded things to preserve this. Um, so, uh, excuse me. What are the ways I can get rid of the affliction? Well, I can get rid of it through vitality or I can get rid of it through money. If I want the vitality, I study, um, I study health, and it'll turn it into vitality. I'll have enough time to do that, but that locks up study, and of course, study, I have so many books available. So I have a surplus of funds. I have a shortage of study time. Pretty easy decision here that I say use this affliction. Now, it's very likely the pulsing airs might turn into vitality on its own, but... Um, I do actually want to use... I, I want to have as much health as possible because I want to use these pulsing airs in the superior contract at the Ecdysis Club. So, Arun's scholarship is dubious, but he, she, rates pithily. Incidents of sudden and violent death are interspersed with aphorisms. Hours don't dream, longs try not to. So I'm going to add the final layer to our, our Tower of Power. Um, upgrade influences. It might be possible with the right combination of influences to raise them to a higher power. So if I had an urgency of appetite, which unfortunately I don't, and if I had a waking chant, This is the cheater's way of uh, <laughs> of keeping this thing preserved. Now, incidentally, it's not costless, right? Because I'm not actually getting this. Uh, I'm not actually getting the thing that I need from the study. But I, I kind of neglected what the. Oh, this is an interesting possibility. The same self. I am no further along my path of change. For the movements of the secret forms, I must find my lesson. Interesting. So let's see what happens if I take pulsing airs, 
rat. <laughs> to study, one must generally sit quite still. Restlessness is rarely the ally of scholarship. That's cute. So this thing is like, ah, I use the hard influence, but it's no, it's not the hard influence. It is the it is the actual like influence card that's required. So, um, but yeah. So this is like consider what this means to me um, in terms of my dilemma. So like some people say it's an exploit. It kind of is. Like obviously I'm able to make something last longer than it's supposed to. But what's happening? Well, this restlessness is going to be counting down, and there's not much I can do about it. I can't put it in any of these areas. Uh, I'm also not using the study block to be able to do the thing I really want to do, which is to use these books. Um, the main thing is, though, I actually want to see what happens when I have a lot of heart and I, I do this special ecdysis club. And I know because I'm studying, uh, because I'm preparing a treatise, I wouldn't have enough time to, to be able to work on it. So um, in this case, I wanted to preserve it long enough to be able to, to do my thing. I've now hit that level. So now I can pursue scholarship again. And um, in this case, I suppose I should probably start re getting some lanterns. So the humors of a gentleman, Samuel Samage's satirical comedy on the intrigues of the ailing but cunning John's son, his mistress Mavelin, her lover Leo, and the upstart Corvino. By the end of the first act, Mavelin has revealed a secret door in the walls of the house to Leo, and Corvino has taken to consuming worms. So we will carry on. I want to be a little careful on this because I, I do have a specific task I want to perform on short short notice. I think I'm going to still send the pawn out to explore just because I don't really have anything better to do with my uh, with my time here at the moment. That will change. Okay. So finish the manuscript. Reason down. Get this wood whisper back. All right, so this will probably mean that I, I lose the contract at the Gaiety again, but we'll work with what we have. Okay, so our recipe will be one Agdysis Club. Mr. Agdistus guides me from the dressing room to the stage. He was a dancer once himself, but you can, see, uh, you can still see it in his gestures. But the wound in his thigh keeps him from the stage. So change, we'll double up our ability of heart. And finally, we will put that six influence in. So this is an 11 heart. Um, work at the Agdysis Club, a rising viper. Tonight we bring serpents to the stage to move with us, and we are scale-masked and sinuous like serpents ourselves. The stage is ringed with light, and the air is silver mist. Though my sweat runs down the nape of my neck, tonight we dance for the moon. Yeah, so this is just it, uh, casual nothing, is that I, like, I do think it is an exploit, and I suspect it is one, like, I would not be upset, having done other exploits in the game, I would not be upset if they got rid of it in the game. But on the other hand, I think that you are also, I, like, I think it would be wrong for people to say that they are not losing anything doing that trick. Um, you know, being able to like sort of time shift something through a talk is a little, I'll admit it's, it's a little gimmicky, um, but it's not, you know, like you're, you're giving something up to get it. It's, you know, I'll just repeat what we said. Like it's, it's not a free, it's not a free lunch by any means. Come with me. So I can live with more mystique. And we have got Dorothy. Dorothy is enthusiastic about, uh, with a sort of eclectic reading habit. She's fascinated by, uh, by my hints about the shapes beneath the world's skin. And we will certainly Add her in. This one is ready. Hello, 
Hello, darkness, my old friend. All right, season of suspicion. So shouldn't be too worried if I wind up with... Again, Mystique is not the end of the world. The Weary Detective is not... Um, is not erratic, so I don't need to worry about it suddenly turning into trumped up evidence. But uh, it is a problem if I feel that I'm going to be generating notoriety with any of my actions over the next little while, so I still just want to be careful. The play is scabrous and occasionally hilarious. The characters are contrary and capricious. Many of the more resonant lines might well be formula of power disguised in plain sight. So it has ex been expressed like this. Each hour has its color, but color exists only where there is light. All right, what else are we going to do? Probably the last book that we'll study. You know what, let's just start. We'll, we'll, it's light bedtime reading. The 17th century and mystic and antiquarian Claude Herschel describes divergent incidents in five major histories. The prologue warns at length of the iniquities of one Julian Cosley, a former colleague who Herschel now describes darkly as a worm of worms. It seems Cosley advised Herschel early in the writing of the book, but Herschel later became suspicious. You're not allowed to end the stream until I find Clavette, by the way. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, I do need to, I can't end the stream until I address Seti's question, though. It took, took me a little longer than I was expecting, but I will get to it. I've, I've not, not neglected you. I know you've been waiting. All right, the ceremony is resident. There's thunder in the church. I know it well. I wrote it myself. Dorothy is an enthusiastic sort, and I have turned her enthusiasm to our advantage. Wait. Bad. So we'll chat about the... You know what? Let's just chat about this thunderous secret instead. This is the course, the course of the heart, right? Okay, good news there. There we go. At the dance's climax, the paroxysm seizes me and I convulse until the movement in my chest re uh, realizes itself. A rising viper. It pours from my mask's mouth like a sickness and streams down my body and is gone from the stage. The audience applauds wildly. I stumble away, chest heaving. I know the serpent will return the same way it came, when it and I are ready. So, leaf, I tremble when the wind comes, my veins beneath the surface are apparent. I always carry a bead of malachite next to my skin. Basis club is closed, it's my superior contract. So I've gained Guy's Viper. The Viper coils when the sea folds itself against the land. I must find a place of power at the water's edge. Perhaps Sulochana can help. If I bring her secrets about other places, some part of you can roam in serpent shape. Send it to accompany your followers to a place where it can perform the dance that you must dance. If you have problems finding the place, talk to Sulochana about secret histories. And we got some money for the cool trick. All right, so that's going to give me some reasons to do cult scraps. I think it's Karishim that I need to, to do this in, but uh, we will figure that out tomorrow. I did want to sort of make sure that uh, I did want to make sure that I at least moved up. So this is the level of the dancer that I've gotten to on the Steam stream. I'll uh, get my my job back at the Gaiety just uh, just in case. So yeah, I. Um, I did want to make sure that we at least finally got one of the guises, because I actually think that's the interesting part of the dancer, and it's the part that I haven't actually been able to do because I accepted the marriage proposal um, on that particular stream, so... Um, okay, as a high copper content is actually kind of toxic when repeat, with uh, repeated skin exposure, so maybe not wear it for protection. I did not know that, by the way, since... So. Um, all right, I'm done for tonight, um, but I did want to take a moment. I know, you know, I got chatty like I was, like I've been before. It's kind of why I'm not writing anymore. Um, okay, guys, I swear this time I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to serious, seriously make some big progress in the game. We made progress, but I'm, you know, I, I did have that digression on definition of gamer and such. Um, but uh, I wanted, I did want to take a minute to answer what Seti said. So the question that Seti said, um, this comment you made here in chat. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, I feel like this is the most difficult kind of channel to find on Twitch. You really need to be looking at the category of the game that you're currently playing. 
Uh, it was just a comment I made in chat before. I find that three-figure viewerships make chat optimal, but there's no way to scout for those channels specifically. So this is... Um, not, not everybody thinks of their channel in these terms. Um, so... I don't make a living doing this, and usually any money that goes into the stream goes sorry that like comes to me from the stream goes directly back into the stream so that's usually in the form of some kind of like a computer upgrade or, or anything along those lines and i'm happy to do that because this is a fun um this is a fun kind of uh of hobby to have um and to be honest i i'm probably running out a lot like i don't i don't meticulously account this but I tend to find that if you are dedicating a certain amount of time to something, it is helpful to do a um, as if this were a business thing. So if I were to run this channel as a business, what are some things that I would reflect on? Well, you know, in terms of a business, you want revenues to be larger than expenses. And in fact, particularly, you would like the difference between revenues and expenses to be enough to allow you some degree of return, ideally one that will give you whatever standard of living you feel is appropriate for what you're doing. Um, if you're doing something that you love and you feel that is your reason for being on here, you know, on this earth, um, like Culta Simulator, um, you can get away with a lower pay. Whereas if you are doing something unpleasant or you feel is sort of orthogonal to your definition of self, um, you'll probably want to command some kind of a price premium. So I'll put it to you this way. Um, if I were to have a job Okay, so if I went to work for a bank again, um, especially with the education that I have, I would expect them to pay a very high premium because I do not find the work that they tend to give me to be very interesting. And I sort of know that I have value elsewhere. And I consider how interesting the work is to be part of my compensation. But all of this is just a big way of saying that, you know, you, so, even though I don't make money doing this thing, uh, it doesn't mean that I can't benefit from playing let's pretend and like, okay, so, you know, how does one make revenue? Well, for the purposes of Twitch, a channel my size, really it's donations and subscriptions. Um, some people set up a Patreon. I've not felt a need to do that because I don't think I give enough added things for a Patreon. And I figure if people want to donate to the channel, they can already do that through the donation button. If, incidentally, you do want a Patreon, let me know. I will always be happy to take your money. I just sort of need to figure out the reason why I would recommend somebody to use a Patreon as opposed to the other means that they already have. Hey, Malemony, we're actually just wrapping up now, so I'll just warn you, we're done with Call to Simulator. I'm giving a, a long-form answer to a question that Seti uh, brought up. But it's kind of neat because this, in some ways this is like the way that a streamer way of playing cult a simulator in real life you know how do i balance all of my uh how do i balance all of my priorities against each other so um then i asked the question okay how do i get more viewers and you know you raise the exact problem that a channel like mine has which is you know, how do you find your how do you find your next big stream? Well, I do it like I find my next big game. I look at people who I enjoy watching the stuff of. So, for instance, Malemony, I originally found through K5, is a streamer in her own right. I've played Stellaris with, um, tolerates my behavior in Stellaris, and is actually a lot of fun to have inside of chat. So if Malemony were to say to me, hey, you should check out this streamer. I think you'd really enjoy them. Um, I would pay attention. 
and I would pay attention more so than what's actually happened before of some guy coming into the channel and saying like, hey, watch so-and-so, they're a new streamer. I'm like, everyone's a new streamer. Everybody's looking for a new audience. What's in it for me? Like, why do I, what benefit do I have for watching this stream as opposed to what of what my other options? That was nice of you to say, How out of character. I'm, I'm a nice person until you get to know me. Um, but yeah. Oh, I'm getting to the discovery study, but it's just I'm, I'm giving you an idea of the perspective that I that's kind of driven me to this. So it's like, okay, so let's say I wanted to, you know, if if I want to ma if I want to improve revenues, how do I get more people watching me? Well, I've really set myself up for a lack of success on Twitch because I'm a variety streamer. I play, that means that I play a bunch of different games. Now I do have some regularity in terms of the game. So every Monday I'm going to play a Paradox Grand Strategy game. Every Wednesday I'm going to play Cultist Simulator. It's not always true. Like obviously I took a break from Cultist Simulator and you know every once in a while Paradox releases something uh, that I feel is appropriate for the Monday that isn't Grand Strategy. But this is generally how I structure things. Now, one thing I could have done to improve the viewership of the channel would be to go primarily Call to Simulator once it became a successful thing, because it is still like it's, you know, triple triple digit viewership numbers on a new Call to Simulator video, at the very least, you know, respectable mid double digits. Whereas even like the Elder Scrolls stuff, the Elder Scrolls stuff started strong, but it struggles to, to even hit beyond single digit viewership. That's fine. I'm, you know, sometimes you just do stuff because it's fun. I, I am having fun playing the Elder Scrolls games on their own. But, you know, in this case here, for some, let, let's say there was somebody who was born to just love my content. They're my number one fan. Right now for them to find me on Twitch on its own, they have to be interested in the game that I'm playing. They have to be looking for that game that I'm playing at the time that I'm online and chances are I need to be streaming it at a time when another even like moderately sized or like anything other than a brand new caster is broadcasting it because most channels are going to have more viewers than me and that means I'm going to be lower on the rank. So one of the things that could actually help Discovery and what a lot of people who are in my state do is uh, they focus on one game and that's actually a very decent way of helping grow a channel because I think people do like that level of consistency and it allows basically you get to roll the dice on that potential super fan each time because of course if they're consistently looking for that game that they like like the likelihood of somebody finding me through my variety um, stuff is like one in a million it's it's very rare it's cool when it happens um, and there's people like uh, um, Ah, sorry. My mind is trolling. Endors. Um, I was going to say Eyes of Sin, but it was Endors who did this. Um, Endors came in when I was playing Gods Will Be Watching to an empty broadcast. Um, and he still hangs around. It's very cool that that happened, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of the ways that I counteract that is to you know, let people know when I'm broadcasting on Twitter. Uh, people like the Eyes of Sin have been very good at kind of getting my name out in other channels. Like, she mods for a lot of people, and she's definitely somebody who I think a lot of people listen to, and rightly so, because she's really a sweet person. Um, then there's also people like K5. Like, K5, I, you know, I wish I gave K5 more attention, uh, and Malemony for that matter, because I feel I, I feel like Malemony's sort of shoutouts always get rolled into K5s, but she's actually her, a talent in her own right. Um, the, but yeah, so this is just it. Like a, a lot of this has grown through word of mouth, and that's good because honestly, that's probably going to be more conducive to the kind of people who will tolerate me doing chats like this. Um. But, uh, but Mel's got a good point here, which is, you know, uh, my Steam streams do help me get some new viewers. That's how we broke 2,000 and stayed above 2,000 followers. 
So Ego, um, Weather Factory invited me to do a stream on Steam of Culta Simulator. So if you would click on Culta Simulator, the game, for the time that I was up there, and they're about seven or eight hour casts, um, you would see me broadcasting the game on that page. Um, and they dwarf, they dwarf even my YouTube videos. Like the, it is by far the largest, largest audience I ever get for, uh, online content. So, uh, that's right. Casual nothing. Um, I actually think I remember seeing you came from the most recent one on the dancer. Didn't you? I seem to remember like seeing your name in my, in my email. Uh, cause I still get emails when people follow on, on Twitch. So all of you people who unfollow, I know. <laughs> um, the risk at that point is to develop an audience that's ultimately not the scope of the chat. Well, sure. And I mean, that's the problem that some people get when they move from being a single game and they, and they, they branch out. Um, like uh Sikonur, who's sort of like the head of streaming at paradox he basically just does blood bowl and he's very happy to do blood bowl and this is the thing like i like cult of simulator a lot but cult of simulator is not the only game i'm interested in um i'm also actually going to be looking forward to doing in other waters when that becomes available um or spin mortality is one that i backed and obviously i'm going to do the full thing of nighthawks because i enjoyed that so much and i know the demo is so short so you know i want to stream that game for people um, I do, if, you know, there's enough of a single player campaign to make it worthwhile, I'd actually like to stream Battlefield 5. I know a lot of people who like Cult of Simulator probably don't have a lot of time for Battlefield 5 games, but I'm hoping that I can do it in a way that interests people. Um, so there's that trade-off. Um, and you're right, like, in one sense, um, over time you will cultivate an audience that is there for... Um, you, you'll cultivate this audience that is kind of there for you, and that's nice, but the thing is, is that you don't grow very quickly when you do that. Um, because again, you're relying on that small subset of people who are going to follow you, you know, all the way, no matter what you do. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable for people who are watching twitch to have some expectations in terms like so if i switched to like a professional dota 2 stream and i didn't interact with chat i just kind of played the way that pro dota players do i would expect to see a shift in the composition of viewership and because dota 2 is fairly sat saturated by comparison i would also expect the viewership to go down and i don't know i mean i'm, I'm not that big to begin with um but, um, but yeah, honestly, like, again, this is why I say it's behave as if it's a business, because I would like to see the channel grow. And I take it as a I take it as a, an indicator in terms of how I'm doing that, you know, I sort of reflect on the fact that the Elder Scrolls videos started off very strong and they've tapered off, which means people are not connecting with it. And it's totally understandable to see why because who the hell wants to watch somebody play the entirety of an Elder Scrolls original, like, early game, including the identification and the sale of the items? Like, my pseudo-Dark Elf voice is just not that good. That That is not enough to sustain 50 hours of viewing. Um, so it's not entirely surprising to me that those numbers have gone down. It's a shame. It would be nice if it did. And who knows, maybe maybe word will get out that this guy is doing this insane, you know, throat ruining playthrough of the Elder Scrolls. But um, that is very much a, a moment of self-indulgence for me, just like some of the monologues are. The nice thing is that you guys do seem to respond, at least in terms of the Twitch interaction, you guys do seem to engage with it and of course that's one of the reasons why they go on longer because cult of simulator does promote discussion they promote certain ideas and we follow those ideas to their conclusion um but um you know again like it's it's um 
you know, the, the best, in my view, the best way to find streams like this really is through the recommendations of friends. And that's why, you know, personally, in my own case, I think some of the best stuff that you guys do is recommend this stream to other people. Um, I, I honestly think it's the best way to let something like this grow. Um, but I also don't lose too much sleep. At, I lose too much sleep at night because I'm streaming too late. I, I don't lose too much sleep over the numbers because, again, it's a... It's a hobby. Like, if, if I were to know with certainty tomorrow that this is the last stream that I would ever do, that if I ever went on Twitch again and I would have a zero viewership, um, you know, it would be a little sad. Like, obviously, you don't want something that you've put some time into to, arm, you know, to, to suddenly end um, in a, you know, in such an abrupt way. But I wouldn't be... Like, I wouldn't be at a loss about what to do. Um, in one sense, it would be, you know, 9 to 12 hours a week plus whatever it takes to record the, the Elder Scrolls stuff. You know, that would give me time to pursue some of these other things that I, I do. So, I, um, you know, like, I, I just, I personally, in my own case, and this isn't true of all streamers, um... I would feel that if I sort of said, if the numbers don't start going up, I'm not going to be broadcasting anymore. You know, it's not exactly a tantrum, but I'd kind of feel like I was holding one. Like, so some people can take that view and say, like, for this to be worth my time, I do need to see some progress in terms of viewer numbers. I want to make a career of this, or I at least want some indication that I'm connecting with people and, and improving. And that's totally fine for them to say. A lot of people get into this for different reasons. Um, I do require that this be interesting to me. This is at least sufficiently interesting to me to hit the start streaming button. And I'll admit, I don't feel like it every day, but I get into the habit of doing it because I know if I skip one day, it's gonna be a lot easier to skip the next day. And all of a sudden a month has gone by and I haven't streamed. Um, but yeah, I mean, your, your original point on saying this is the hardest kind of stream, it's, it is much truer than you, you may imagine. Like I, I have been given really great opportunities by Weather Factory to reach an audience I wouldn't normally. And I also know a large part of that audience ultimately is not interested in my channel because I'm not primarily called a simulator and they have the reasonable expectation that the sort of person who appears on the recommendation of the maker of the game that they like will have more regular Cult of Simulator content. Um, and it's a big batching problem, right? I would much rather somebody find a streamer that they relate to better than to sort of force them into, into my own channel. Like, it's not, uh, you know... I don't need to take hostages to, to get something out of this. So anyways, let me just do a quick, uh, quick um, follow up. It was the one on Lovecraft Day. My apologies, casual nothing. So the, the hard drive isn't isn't as effective as I thought it was. Um, maybe you'll finally play a non-Dutch U4 campaign. Never going to happen. I always play Holland. Um, but yeah. Anyways, guys, I've worn out my welcome. Thank you very much for hanging out. Um, I appreciate, especially the YouTube crowd who doesn't always get to see what's on the channel. If you made it to the end, well done. You get a sticker or a star or a hearty handshake and a pat on the back, whatever uh, works well for you. Perhaps if you are going to sleep, you would just like this soft voice to send you off. Um... So, Ego says, thank you for the stream system, Jock. Thank you for the interesting discussions to you all in chat. So have a good one and see you hopefully another time. We'll be back Friday. I might be trying something new, but... Oh, Rouge Light Girl, I'm sorry. I'm actually heading off for tonight. But hang around because I'm going to host W. Shand, I think. Um, w. Shand is doing the Midnight Society, spooky, scary games. Uh, it looks like he was just doing a giveaway recently. I think a lot of you already know who he is. If you want to do the System Shock raid um, message, works for me. So if we're tired of System Talk, heard this place was better. 
Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna leave you in his capable hands for the evening. I should also mention that Kilgore Trout is currently doing Legacy of Cain Soul Reaver. So both of those are, are good streamers that I'm sure you'll enjoy, but I'm gonna I'm gonna drop things off at Shan's channel for the next uh, next little bit. So thank you all, and we will see you Friday. <laughs>